Good morning, everybody. My name is Dorota Terlinski. I'm a lawyer with Tierney Stauffer, um, a law firm here in Ottawa. And I practice in estate law, um, both from the side of uh, solicitor um, capacity and uh, litigation. So uh, capacity and will challenges are quite directly connected to, to my practice. And um, I'm happy to be here today to share with you um, just snippets of, of the foundations of um, this area of law. So it is um, it's quite a broad area. Um, just the word capacity is, um, and its interpretations, the definition of it is, is quite a uh, minefield. So I'm going to try and simplify um, and to focus on um, only some uh, of the areas of interest. Um, so, as I understand it, um, if you have any questions or comments, um, I would, you know, I, I strongly invite them, uh, but I think that they come uh, be after the presentation. And I'll speak for about um, 25 to 30 minutes, and um, then I will leave the rest of the time for any questions that might arise. So we'll get started. Um, so there are really three areas that I want to go into today. Um, and that is the foundation of our understanding of testamentary capacity and um, the procedure. So that would be the court process um, and what's important within that process. And um, thirdly and finally, the gray areas. And of course, in all areas of law, we have gray areas and um, this is uh, no exception. So we'll get started um, with the foundations. And before I get into the foundations, I want to I want to sort of um, talk about why it is that wills are challenged. Um, so one of the first reasons is uh, formal requirements under the Succession Law Reform Act are, are just not met in the will. Um, and often you see that with um, at-home wills or um, self-made wills. Uh, so things like two witnesses have not, or witnesses that are beneficiaries have uh, witnessed the will. Um, those uh, those components will not be in compliance with the formal uh, aspects of, of a will, of a valid will. Um, the second um, reason why a will could be challenged is that um, the testator actually had no knowledge or did not approve of the will's contact. So um, at the end of the day, it comes down to evidence, but if you, um, if, if you can prove that the testator actually had no knowledge of the cause that was in the, um, in the will, then you're running in, into a major problem um, of validating the will uh, after the person uh, has, has died. Um, so uh, the other reason, of course, is undue influence, and we see more and more of that as, as we become a little, well, much more attuned to uh, power imbalances in testator beneficiary relationships, um, uh, which we, generally speaking, we know um, those power imbalances and their susceptibility to undue influence is often in the context of family relationships. So. Um, parent child um, child wanting the best for their their parent um, but in fact they're um, they're applying undue influence uh, resulting in the testator actually um, actually specifying a wish that, that that would not have otherwise been been indicated um, and certainly the last uh, reason for challenging a will, and, and the one we are going to be focusing on today, is um, lack of testamentary capacity. And those four reasons, uh, this is not to say that they run independent of one another. Um, they're very often actually um, focused on together, uh, or alleged together, um, in, in a claim. So lack of testamentary capacity. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> testamentary capacity in general is the ability to execute a legally valid will. 
So it's a short sentence, but it's quite loaded. Um, so just to mention capacity again is the ability to execute a legally valid well. So it's quite loaded in the sense that um, there are definitions that need to come with understanding this definition itself. Um, so the ability, uh, what does that mean? And then execution, proper execution, what does that mean? And a valid will, well, what's a valid will? I mean, if it is a legally valid will, um, and what does legally valid mean? So hopefully through the presentation today, I'll be able to elucidate some of, uh, some of the meaning behind this um, loaded sentence. And um, so it's also worth mentioning that testamentary capacity is one of many capacities. So when we think about capacity, we think about capacity to do what? So it's task specific. And um, there is a spectrum that I've sort of tried to list here. Um, so I tried to, to list the different types of capacities that are required um, from the least stringent test to, uh, to, the strict, to the strictest test, which is testamentary capacity. So um, from the lowest, uh, so to make a gift, it's a different test and it's not as strict. Um, the capacity to revoke or appoint powers of attorney, that's uh, actually pretty clearly, that the capacity to, to appoint or revoke powers of attorney is pretty clearly indicated in the um, uh, Substitute Decision Act section 8 and 47. Um, to manage your own personal care, that's at section 45 in, in the Substitute Decision Act. And to manage property, also at section 6 of the SDA. Um, so the testamentary capacity, um, Penny and Boland, the case it stands for the proposition that um, the, the threshold for um, meeting the testamentary capacity test is um, is the highest there is for capacity um, in case law. So now we are here talking about capacity in the estate context. Um, so capacity is also considered in other areas of law. Um, so capacity to enter into a contract um, is one example. Okay, so foundation of our understanding of testamentary capacity um, is rooted in case law. Um, legislation doesn't inform, um, it, sorry, it informs our understanding of capacity and as far as it comments on, uh, as I've noted here, um, as it, it suggests capacity or what testamentary capacity might be by defining um, the capacity required to appoint revoke power of attorney and manage personal care and property. So um, there are some, some suggestions, but um, there's nothing um, black and white or clearly elucidated in the um, in legislation at this time. So I, like I said, it's case law and the um, the seminal case in uh, testamentary capacity is Boy, that's um, that's 140 years over, so 145 years now. Um, so that's the foundation, <clears throat> and it's still um, it's still good law. So stemming from this case um, are various judgments that we will talk about um, later. But this is certainly the foundation of all discussions about um, testamentary capacity. And um, maybe I'll just give you some facts around uh, this case. So it's 1870s England, um, and John Banks was a, um, so he was a draper, and he was quite successful. Um, he owned 15 cottages, and he had a sister named Margaret. And his sister, um, he had, sorry, he had a, a sister named Margaret and then a half-brother named Jacob. Um, in 1838, uh, in his mid-20s, John made, a, so he executed a will all in favor of Margaret. So, so Margaret, his sister, was the only beneficiary. And um, unfortunately, three years after he executed this will, he was actually confined. Um, he was 
he was um, he was diagnosed as a lunatic and he was placed in a county lunatic asylum. Um, and this is not the first and last of his delusional states. In fact, he um, he was readmitted into the asylum many times thereafter. So um, he had very specific delusions um, about this man named Featherstone Alexander, who John was just convinced that this man uh, was pers constantly pursuing him and he molested him in the past and will do so again. Um, so John was extremely concerned about this man and um, the delusions were so severe that, that he was confined. Um, and in fact, every time that you mentioned the name Featherstone Alexander, he would, he would, it would just throw him into, into um, an insane rage. Um, and in fact, these delusions continued even after Featherstone died. So, um, so Margaret, his, uh, John's sister, marries a man named Thomas Goodfellow um, in 1846. And then Margaret unfortunately dies uh, during childbirth. So uh, Thomas Goodfellow uh, has an, so he marries again and he has a wife. Uh, sorry, he gets married again and he, and he has a son with this new wife. And um, uh, this new son is um, is actually the um, the defendant in this case. So, and then John's niece, Margaret Banks Goodfellow. I know that this is getting complicated, but you'll be able to appreciate why I'm going into all these details. Um, so, John's niece, after John, the original John, gets. Um, uh, released from the asylum, he has his niece Margaret Banks Goodfellow um, come live with her. And um, there was a landlady that took care of both John, who was um, on and off, who was in stable, and, and the niece. In 1863, John seeks out a solicitor and says, I want to make a will. Uh, Margaret, my sister, is gone and I want to leave everything to my niece. Um, and the will was executed. Uh, it was executed 26 days after um, the, the solicitor received instructions from John. Um, but there didn't seem to be any issue with that. Um, John, uh, the testator, uh, read the, the, the will twice or three times. So there was no issue at the time as to whether or not John understood what he was doing. Um, in 1865, John dies uh, of epilepsy, insanity, and coma. The niece was then 18, um, and she inherited everything. And um, two years later, she herself, the niece, dies of uh, TB, tuberculosis. And therefore, um, the uh, inheritance was passed on to the paternal half-brother of John. And that presented some issues because, because John Banks was not related in any way to now this, this beneficiary. Um, so John Banks Jr. brings action um, against, uh, um, sorry, uh, Junior, John Banks Jr. brings the action uh, because he wants to test the validity of the will executed in 1863. So um, some of the pronouncements that arise from this case are actually quite important. Um, so Justice Brett um, says, whether on the 2nd of December or the 28th of December, or on both, the testator was capable of having such a knowledge and appreciation of the facts and was so far master of his intentions, free from delusions, as would enable him to have a will of his own in the vision of his property and act upon it. So, even then, 145 years ago, um, judges were able to differentiate between, um, or sorry, were able to make, make the um, distinguishing feature of somebody who is able to have testamentary capacity, even though they have been, um, they have been taken to, to an asylum before. Um, so what, what this case suggests from the get-go is that capacity is not a static state. 
Um, and um, fortunately, judges were able to um, take note of that. Um, so a trial, um, it was, uh, the will was upheld, the validity was upheld, and um, same thing on the appeal. Um, and on the appeal, um, I'll move on to the next slide here. So some of the principles that came out of um, out of the appeal judgment are the following. The testator has testamentary capacity if he or she understands the nature of making a will and, its, uh, and the will's effects, understands the extent of the property being disposed of, understands the nature of the act and its effects, appreciates the claims to which he or she ought to have effect, and no insane delusion influences his or her will in disposing of the property and brings about disposal of which, if the mind had been sound, would not have been made. So this is the foundation, actually, of, um, of lawyers taking instructions today. Um, these five criteria must be met and must be at the forefront of our practice when we're uh, retained to, to draft a will. So some of the other cases that have come out of, um, that have, uh, sorry. Some of the other cases that, that have, Canadian cases that have um, <clears throat> certainly relied on um, Banks and Goodfellow um, are uh, so Leger and Poirier. So if the testator was not able to comprehend matters beyond a limited scope at the time he gave will instructions, but was only able to answer simply everyday questions, nothing more detailed, then his will was not made by a free and capable mind. So here, Judges, you know, make a foray into, um, well, what do we need as as lawyers in order to um, receive instructions that where we do not question capacity? Um, and so, what this case suggests is that these instructions must be specific, and that there must be an awareness and uh, a broad understanding um, by the testator of their entire estate and the kinds of um, assets that they might hold. So this is what this, this is why I included this case. And certainly, please go ahead and um, look it up. Um, I'm sure if you enjoy this kind of reading, there's uh, there's a great amount of cases that can be read. Okay, um, this case here, Scott and Cousins, is important because um, it suggests that superficial impression of alertness is not testamentary capacity. So many times um, you may see even in your own practice that, that um, clients come in and you're just not sure um, whether it's in the estate or in other, uh, in other um, uh, areas of law. The instructions that you've been given are maybe sound scripted or it sounds like Maybe the, the the person practiced what what they had to say um, in giving instructions. Um, these are all red flags. So um, a lot of it, though, because it's not an objective test, it's extremely difficult to um, you know sort of trust your gut uh, at some points and and say, well, this seems to me like a superficial impression of alertness. Um, so. This is where notes and um, documenting your visits with clients is extremely important. Um, and of course, discussing with colleagues and, and superiors, um, maybe some of the dilemmas that you might have. Um, and certainly capacity is one of the areas that I found in my practice. I've, whenever I question or whenever I'm in doubt, I always go to another lawyer or someone who is more experienced than me in, in the area and who can sort of pitch in. And if, if we're both not sure, then we will um, resort to, to other ways of assuring ourselves that capacity is there. I'll talk about these areas in a second. And I'm just going to ask about my time. How am I doing on time? 10 minutes. Okay. So I'm going to try and speed through this because we still have quite a bit to get through. So. Um, in 1970, Justice Laskin uh, summarized the elements of capacity, and they sound very much like uh, Banks and Goodfellow. So, I'm not deviating much from from the law there. 
and um, it just the language is a little more palpable. Um, and certainly, if you want to supplement in your practice, um, you know the criteria that you need to meet for yourself when you take the instructions. Um, I would I would look at Schwartz and Schwartz as a case that that might help you sort of find the wording that when you're asking your questions. Okay, I'm going to talk about procedure now, and I'm going to focus on really two different as two aspects. Um, now, again, this is a very convoluted uh, area, and I'm sure there, there could be a university course just on that aspect alone. But I, I'm going to focus just on the onus of proof and the evidence, um, because those uh, tend to not only um, have some surprising aspects of, of procedure when compared to other areas of law, but also um, it really forces us as professionals to bring in professionals from from areas other than the legal realm, specifically the um, health professionals. So questions of testimony capacity are, are raised usually in the court context when there's suspicion that the testator may not have had capacity to execute a will. Um, issues of testimony capacity tend to be raised alongside allegations of undue influence or suspicious circumstances. So, um, 1934 case, those raising allegations of undue influence have the onus of provide, proving undue influence was present. So if the allegation is made of undue influence, there must be um, the reasonable expectation that there, that there were, that evidence would could be provided at the trial, um, unequivocally showing that, that there was undue influence. Undue influence is often um, related with, um, but, but I would say confused with suspicious circumstances. Um, so presumption that the testator knew and approved the contents of the will and had the necessary testimony, uh, sorry, the presumption is that the testator knew and approved of the contents of the will. So that's the presumption. And if you think about it, um, if we questioned uh, every client that came into our office, about whether or not they have the requisite capacity. Um, well, first of all, we'd be out of business, but we would also be inundated with, you know, questions, and um, we would never be able to produce a will. Um, so there's a presumption here, and there's also also the ethical consideration that when you take the so if there's no presumption that the testator knew and approved of the contents of the will, then we're assuming that the person is incapable, and that's taking away from the person their personal liberty um, you know in a legal aspect in a legal way as well as sort of the ethical um, aspects so um, you need to consider those things when when thinking about um, when taking the instructions from your client so uh, the presumption is there um, however if suspicious circumstances are alleged in the claim then where the presumption changes and the presumption um, changes because the onus shifts to the propounder of the will to establish testamentary capacity so what you're dealing with is you're um, there's a, a you're dealing with a claim where suspicious circumstances are alleged and uh, the allegation that the will is invalid is alleged then the respondent to such a claim must have the onus of proving that the will was actually done in circumstances where um, testamentary capacity was in place. And if there are no um, evidentiary <clears throat> aspects to the uh, instrument um, of the will suggesting that there and establishing, sorry, that there is testamentary capacity, in retrospect, it is an impossible exercise, or close to impossible. Um, I want to define suspicious circumstances. So, Fountain Hay, this is another case where there was there were unusual um, circumstances. Um, but in any event, the the case is very important um, because it defined what the suspicious circumstances are. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, they're listed, and um, if you look at the facts of the case, you realize that that 
you can compare the facts of that case to your own cases so that um, you kind of get a flavor of, of what we're looking for when we're um, when we're screening for, for those um, items. Okay, so um, it's also important to understand that when we're dealing with will challenges, um, timing is key. Um, Parker and Fieldgate, this is an old case, but the proposition is that the time that the instructions were provided is the most important time um, at which capacity, testament capacity has to be established. Um, capacity assessments, as we know, are, um, are fraught with problems, um, but at the end of the day, what we need to do as lawyers is to ensure that we are getting the best assessment possibly can of somebody's ability to provide instructions. Um, so we're looking for contemporaneous assessment. Uh, very often with will challenges, you're dealing with someone executing a will and then um, weeks later having capacity assessment or um, weeks prior to or months prior to. Uh, you know, in an ideal world, a capacity assessment is done within a day of, um, of uh, instruction being given. Of course, that's ideal world and, and certainly not possible in, in most cases. So I've, um, I'm, I've included some pointers for um, assessing capacity or satisfying yourself as a lawyer um, of testamentary capacity um, when taking instructions from a client. So um, keep in mind that very often the first capacity assessment that the client has ever had is actually with you. Um, and um, while it's not a medical capacity assessment, um, the evaluation of whether or not they're able to provide instructions um, is actually carried out for the first time when they meet with somebody to do a will. Um, so I've indicated a, a case that um, that suggests the, the, the level of, um, or the level of the duty of the lawyer to um, when receiving instructions and when preparing wills. Um, and for that, because will challenges are a post-doc exercise, um, you need to have records, you need to have um, written documents um, based on your visits with the client. Also, the Law Society has some pretty helpful wills and estates checklists that you can refer to. Um, physicians um, are another source of capacity assessments. Um, I note here a study that was done uh, to, to evaluate the accuracy of physicians making doing capacity assessments. And really the takeaway is that these capacity assessments or the validity of the results of the capacity assessments are not um, the most valid things in the world. Um, a psychiatrist, not surprisingly, had were most likely to be correct in their assessments, and family doctors had the least capacity and uh, or sort of <laughs> the least accuracy. That's what I meant. The least um, accuracy in determining capacity. And um, if you think about it, I mean, seeking out a physician's opinion is very often um, the, the go-to for, for lawyers. But um, this study in any, ways, in any way um, suggests that this may not be the most accurate way of evaluating capacity. Um, certified capacity assessors. So when in doubt, um, capacity assessments are key. So again, at the time when the instructions are taken. Um, if there's any doubt at all, um, there's nothing wrong with saying to a client, look, I'm not singling you out, um, but um, because we want to ensure that this will will never, will not, or not never, but will be less likely to be challenged in the future, we need you to get a capacity assessment. Um, here's a caveat that um, capacity assessments are based uh, on a mini mental state examination. And that is um, one test that's received quite a bit of criticism. And I think the, the message that I want to send out today is that 
none of these methods of assessing capacity are actually um, perfect. Um, in fact, um, it's, it's, it's established that they're, they're flawed. But, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we should discard them altogether. I think that the, the message is that you won't get perfection, but you have a duty as a lawyer to try and uh, determine capacity. Um, so I just put this case in, um, this is a recent case about, I just wanted to show you just some recent developments in the area of will challenges. Um, and it comes down to even very simple procedural aspects such as the limitation period and does it apply to will challenges. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that if you are interested. And um, I want to talk about some gray areas. So I just got my 10 minutes left um, sign and I'm going to really rush through this. Um, so the gray areas. I want to talk about unusual bequests. Um, unusual bequests are um, bequests or gifts that are made in a will that maybe the family does not agree with. Um, so if you go back to um, you go back to suspicious circumstances, <clears throat> any one of these factors in itself does not um, does, does not uh, absolutely um, determine that the person is incapable. Okay? Uh, just because there are suspicious circumstances does not mean that somebody uh, does not mean that somebody is is incapable of, of providing instructions. Um, what it does mean is that perhaps, and this is, I think that the, this is the extent of the conclusion that you can make, is that suspicious circumstances um, allow a person who's susceptible to, um, to incapacity uh, of, of being unduly influenced. So that's, that's a conclusion that I'm willing to, to make. But I think that we should be very careful of making those conclusions. And, and so, um, I wanted to, to point out, you know, family does not recognize as deserving. Well, um, in these unusual bequest cases, which there are many, but I've just, um, I've just pointed out two. The, the question always becomes, well, if the, is the person not capable or is it that we don't agree with the choice that was made in this will. And if it's the latter, then you're, then you're not facing a testamentary capacity issue. You are dealing with um, just disagreement um, on the basis of value system or what have you. So um, Charles Vance Miller, this is a person who was a, actually, a, he left a will where he left a significant amount of money for the woman who will bear the most children in a defined uh, amount of time. So it had nothing to do, he was, he was a jokester, like so everybody knew that he liked to play jokes. And he actually included, I guess, another joke in his will. So that's a strange request um, to make. It's not usual at all, but, but was he incapable? There was no suggestion that he was incapable. Well, it was a suggestion, but there were, but, um, it was never actually um, um, the the will challenge was was never accepted by the courts. Janis Joplin apparently in her will um, put thousands of dollars for her friends to have a wild party after she dies, and that's a strange bequest. But was she incapable? Well, knowing Janis Joplin's history with um, drug addiction, maybe maybe she was, but at the time of instructing, there did seem to be um, any question of capacity. You also have to be careful about lack of capacity and diminished capacity. It's a spectrum and it's gradients. Um, I'm going to leave you with just these uh, quotes from Dr. Ken Shulman from uh, Toronto, who's an expert in the area. Um, just He talks about the gray zones um, quite eloquently. And um, I think that we have to be mindful of these areas uh, when we practice. And what I would say at the end of the day <clears throat> is 
be you know completely open if you have any doubt as to the person's capacity. Um, do your research, but also reach out to your colleagues, reach out to your mentors, superiors, um, because likely uh, the reason why you're in doubt is because you're in the gray area. And so um, you don't want to be um, you know, uh, questioning the client when it's not really warranted. But at the same time, um, you need to satisfy yourself, it's a professional obligation to satisfy yourself that, that, that you have followed the, um, the factors outlined in Benson Goodfellow and in the later cases and um, that you've taken your notes and that you've done the best that you can to ensure that the person who you're taking instructions from is has the requisite capacity. Hello everyone, pleased to speak with you. My name is Ken Pope. I'm a, a lawyer who has a provincial and interprovincial practice assisting uh, families who have children with disabilities and special needs. Uh, that includes wills and trusts, uh, tax credit, back filings, uh, Ontario Disability Support Benefit Program increases, um, guardianship applications, and a variety of things. Uh, you'll be interested to know that conservatively, approximately one family in ten uh, is uh, the parent of or the sibling household for a person with disabilities or special needs, and that's a conservative estimate. So in the sense of uh, estate planning, uh, identifying this factor is critical because it's a critical issue for the family. Um, in order to, uh, to do a proper assessment and assist the family correctly, uh, you have to have an intake process. It's not sufficient to say, oh, well, you, know, you have a child with disabilities and therefore you need a will with the hands and trust. Um, that's a, you know, a large part of the process, of course, but you have to have a better understanding of the family as a whole and the circumstances of the child with special needs and their age and their circumstance. So what we'll do is we'll follow the, uh, the intake process that I have and I'll explain why the uh, components of that intake are important. Uh, firstly, as you can see on this uh, first slide here, you need the contact details for the individual, obviously, so that you can open a file and you know where they live. Um, you need a specific consent, of course, to send email on, under the Newcastle legislation. So the uh, intake form that you'll find, for example, on my website uh, has a specific box as to whether we can send you email. And of course, on your retainers, uh, you'll have to have a special box saying, yes, you can send emails to this address just to protect yourself for future benefit, for future use. Then you need to know who it is that has contacted you. It's uh, quite often uh, a parent, uh, but it could be a person with a disability themselves. It uh, could be some other um, relative, it could be an aunt. Uh, in the case I'm working on right now, it's the, uh, the grandson who is dealing with things for his grandparents because his aunt, the child of the grandparent, uh, was injured uh, falling off a horse when she was young. And so uh, the, the daughter still lives with the parents, uh, but it's the grandson that does the, uh, the speaking, partly because of language issues. Um, the reason that we have to know the occupation uh, is partly to know the client better, know your client. Uh, for any financial advisor, uh, there's a positive know your client rule. You have to know these things. And of course, if you don't ask the family if there is a child with special needs, they may not tell you. It's quite possible that, uh, say, they had a child with some mental health problems, and they, uh, you know, they just don't wish to disclose that for their own reasons. Uh, but you can see on this uh, screen, what is your occupation? It says a uh, question: Will you have an Omers or Teachers or Ontario uh, Power Generator pension? And the reason this is important from an estate planning perspective is that uh, these are provincial statutory pensions. And when a person um, retires and starts to receive their pension, uh, and then they die, uh, if they have a spouse, of course, the spouse then starts to receive a portion of that pension, let's say two-thirds. And what uh, is generally not known is that if you have uh, a municipal, municipal employee pension or a teacher's pension or power generator hydro pension, uh, that pension also passes down to your child with disabilities who is an adult dependent child. 
Uh, of course, there's a pension for a minor child. Um, but this, and this is what happens is the uh, if you start out and you're a teacher and you're retired and you have a $60,000 pension and your husband is pre has predeceased, then your son, who is uh, say 54, uh, when he died and severely autistic, uh, he would start to receive half of your $60,000 your $60, pension. So he'd get $30,000. Now, of course, uh, if the child is uh, an adult and incapable, well, then of course someone has to be their uh, court-appointed legal guardian in order to actually put the pension in place, because of course the child can't. But you can see that a $30,000 pension is a big piece to an estate planning puzzle. Uh, it's also very helpful to find out how people heard about you, how they came across this information, and I would say that uh, more commonly than, than ever, of course, it's uh, through an internet connection, a, a Henson Trust Google search, um, or an ESP Google search. And of course, most of the uh, communications these days is done with email and, and on the phone. Uh, some clients actually come to the office. Sometimes I go to the client and meet with them in the kitchen. Uh, but I would say most of it is done uh, using email and phone and, uh, and, and snail mail. Let's see, next page. Now, uh, the families who contact me are interested in a variety of things. Uh, but the most typical question is about Henson Trusts, Registered Disability Savings Plans, Ontario Disability Benefits, Tax Credits, Guardianship. And typically, uh, when you're working with uh, one of these families, which is a very gratifying process, by the way, you're dealing with some really, really nice families, people that are just Work, have worked hard all their lives, to, of course, to take care of their, their children, and sometimes one or more of those children has disabilities, and 15% uh, of them remain at home with the parents until the parents die. On occasion, uh, it's good all around because a, a child at home, uh, that stays at home, and the parents uh, who are then in their, say, their late 80s or 90s, uh, often they can stay at home longer than they could otherwise, because their son, who's, let's say, uh, 55. Uh, and with guidance, he can drive the car, he can clear the snow, he can cut the grass, he can help with the groceries. Um, all, of, all, all of these things that, uh, um, as a parent get, gets older, they may need assistance with. I also find that um, you generally do more than one thing for a family, and, and over time, you do more things. So when the family first comes to you, uh, you identify whether they have a will or not. Uh, of the people who come to the seminars that I do, and these are the people that know that they need a Henson Trust typically because that's why they're coming to the seminars, 50% uh, don't have a will. And I think that's a pretty common number in the general population as well. And of those who do have a will, very few have trust provisions. If they do have trust provisions, um, the odds are, are small that they'll have a, a correct but simple Henson Trust. Uh, it's quite possible that they'll, that they'll have trust arrangements uh, that are clearly not Henson Trusts, uh, which would therefore still disqualify the child from disability benefits. Uh, and sometimes it's a, an arrangement that's worse than, than nothing. <clears throat> um, as far as uh, registered disability savings plans, from an estate planning perspective for the family and the child, uh, if a child qualifies for the disability tax credit, meaning that they are markedly restricted in some way, then they can have a registered disability savings plan. Now, these plans came in place in uh, 2008, and the short story is that if someone, family member, contributes $1,500 a year, the federal government will contribute $4,500. So, say you set one of these up when the child was uh, 18, and you proceeded to put 1500 a year in for 20 years, which is the, the time frame, uh, the family would put in $30,000, and the government would put in 90. Now, this money would be invested. If it was invested at 5%, at the end of the 20 years, it totals approximately $200,000. And if you then cease making contributions and continue to have it invested at, say, 5%, then by the time the child is 60, which is 
a simple story that it's a, it's a plan for their uh, retirement in a sense, then uh, it's about $500,000, which from an estate planning perspective is a big issue. Uh, remember one case where uh, uh, the parents wanted their estate, because of course the RDSP is the child's estate, they wanted their estate uh, division uh, adjusted so that the uh, eventual $30,000 that they'll have contributed to the RDSP would be set off against that child's share, uh, the, portion, the portion that would be going into the Hanson Trust. I don't see that very often. Though. Now, you need to know as well more about the child, of course. And when I say child, I mean the child of a minor or, or an adult. I need to know their name, obviously. I need to know their date of birth, how old they are. Uh, I need to know more about the nature of the disability. And you need the, the story. You need the family story um, about that child. Uh, because, of course, the, uh, the, the parents are the expert. You know, they, they know more about that child than any, any other professional doctor, social worker, lawyer, accountant. You know, all of these uh, supporting professionals, um, they're not the expert on this child. The parents are the expert. They're, they're the ones that have the, uh, the file folders full of all the reports and tests that have ever been done. Uh, so you need the child's story, and you need to know more about the child. Are they sociable? Uh, which can be a great saving grace. Um, uh, what's the likelihood of their longevity? Is it a girl with Rett syndrome? Um, because these are all factors in the planning. Um, if there's a great likelihood that the child is not going to survive the parents uh, or outlive them, uh, then in the uh, planning for the will and trust arrangements, you have to plan for that possibility. If they're um, over 18, then typically they will be receiving provincial disability benefits Although you still regularly find families where the child is 32, living at home, and um, just has never received provincial disability benefits. Um, the family simply raised the child and she's never bothered. Now, if the child is 18 and uh, the, the test for Ontario Disability Support Benefits is either that, that the child can't function in a competitive workplace or can't function in the community, or can't handle personal care. So the, the test for ODSP is a lesser test than it is for the disability tax credit. Um, although, uh, I would say, half of all people on ODSP would qualify for the disability tax credit. Uh, certainly none, not all do. Now, if they're receiving benefits, what they should receive at present is approximately 1100 a month. But if they're living at home with the parents or, or with a, a brother or and his family, perhaps, they'll typically be slotted into what's called a room and board amount, which is the 841 a month. Uh, so there's about a $250 difference. And we regularly get the benefit increased because it's the child is always slotted into the 841. Uh, we get it increased because, especially if the child could and perhaps does shop and cook themselves, well, then it's not room and board. Uh, they provide, they, 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 they buy their food, they cook their meals, um, so it's not room and board where the child is provided with a room and food. Although in, in most practical situations, of course, the, uh, the parents do, of course, do the shopping, do the cooking. Uh, but it's a good life skill for the child to learn to shop and cook. Uh, it can be done with supervision, uh, even if they're innumerant, even if they, they couldn't make the change. Uh, if they go to an honest supermarket, and I think, as far as I can see, they're all honest, and uh, if they have a cash or they have a debit card, uh, they can pay. I don't think they're going to get cheated. Uh, and if they uh, can Id find items in the store, uh, even if they work from a set list, uh, a repetitive list, frankly, I, I get a list from my wife, so I don't see as much difference. And uh, we buy mostly the same things week after week. So there's no, no issue with that. And what this does, uh, we set up a lease uh, between the parent and the child. Um, typically, uh, the shelter component of the 1098 is about $480. And then the, the rest is supplementary benefits. 
So uh, we set the rent at about $500. Now, uh, this is not rent in the real sense uh, that uh, Canada Revenue Agency expects you to declare it. Uh, it's only rental income if you're in pursuit of profit. And then, of course, if, if what you're doing is uh, having a child pay a contribution towards shelter costs in this way, then it's not really rent. Uh, similarly, uh, the child can't make use of the tenant property tax credit. And even if you made the calculations that, that the $500 is less than a fair share of, uh, say, half of the costs or a third of the costs of running the house, you can't write off the difference either. You can't take an expense. Uh, as far as the, uh, the shopping and cooking, it's even workable uh, if you uh, paid a, a roving chef or a cook, because there, there are people who provide this service, uh, where uh, the food is purchased, the supplies are purchased, and then they come to your home and they make up uh, a set of meals, say um, a variation of three types of meals um, times 10, and then they put it in the freezer, and then the child uh, takes them out and uh, heats them up. That would uh, qualify uh, for not being room and board. Uh, if the child is on a, a G-tube, is being fed with a gastro tube, well, that qualifies uh, because the parents are not providing the food. The food is, is taken in through a tube. It's only, uh, and if the child was in a fully supported living situation where everything is provided, well, the institutional amount that is given to the uh, supported living group home, uh, it's the full amount as well. Uh, it's only the parents or the sibling, for example, if the child lived with a brother who would not, in that, in that circumstance, the child would not receive the full amount and so would then need to be corrected. Um, approximately 15% um, continue to, of people with disabilities continue to live at home with the parents or with a, with a sibling, for example, when the parent has, has passed on. Now, in order to determine if the uh, person uh, would qualify for the disability credit, first you have to ask them, uh, is the person approved? In lots of cases, the, the person is approved, but it's very regularly found that they're not. Uh, I remember I, I did uh, a seminar on a uh, morning and afternoon on a Saturday in Scarborough, and then on a Tuesday afternoon and evening in, uh, in uh, St. Catharines, and we had about, uh, in total, about 150 people at these two events, uh, representing about 100 families, because some people come as a couple and some, of course, one has to stay with the child. Um, and because of the nature of how these seminars were put together and the groups I was working with, uh, all but, I think, one family uh, had children, young and old, uh, who had cognitive difficulties, uh, children with autism, Down syndrome, uh, effects from cerebral palsy. So all of those kids would clearly qualify for the disability tax credit. But when I asked them all, because I tabulate the, uh, the results before I uh, make the sem present the seminar, half of the parents replied no or they didn't know. Which means that 50 of the families either weren't using the credit, although they could be, or they didn't know. And what that means is that a lot of those families didn't know, and a lot of them were not using the credits, which is a bit mind-boggling. You'd think that uh, if you had a child who has Down syndrome or autism, uh, and you've been going to different support group sessions, that you would have heard about the credit, but that's just not the case. So what we do is we identify this, and we then typically, the most typical profile is a family where they either aren't using the credit, but should, clearly should, yeah. or they were, but they haven't for the last 20 years, such that, for example, the uh, child went into a supported living environment and the parents thought that the child had to live with them in order to make use of the credit. And that's not the case. Uh, the credit is uh, transferable to a tax-paying family member, um, a, a parent, a spouse of a parent, a sibling, cousins, aunts. Uh, and to be transferable, the child has to either live with that person, which of course makes it pretty clear, 
uh, or the, the person has to help to some extent with food or shelter or clothing. Now, even if a person is in a fully supported living situation, typically the parents buy the clothes, so the credit is transferable. And as I say, the most uh, typical profile is a 10-year back filing, um, making use of the, uh, the fairness provisions. And the recapture for a 10-year period on the disability credit is about $16,000, which is good. It's simply a credit that should have been used and was not used. And then, then the child can have a registered disability savings plan. Now, the plan holder can either be the person with the disabilities or if they're an adult, for example, and not competent, which of course would qualify in a lot of cases with the disability credit, it indicates a market restriction. Well, then uh, a plan holder can be a parent. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, uh, we had to set legal guardianships in place in order to set up such a plan in order to have access to the federal grants and bonds. But uh, the rules were changed by the federal government uh, two years ago and it'll be effective until 2016 and perhaps it'll be extended uh, such that uh, a parent can be the plan holder. Because of course somebody has to, to determine uh, how the money is going to be invested. Um, what I'm also finding is that uh, six years later, seven years later, uh, that it's time to do an assessment to get a copy of the RDSP statement and to determine what the return on investment is. Because in some cases it's, it's reasonable, but I found a lot of cases where uh, for some years there's really been no attention paid to that. We had one, one uh, mother uh, who had set the plan up very uh, d diligently in December of 2008, but the return on investment since then was 0.5%. This is obviously not very forward-looking. Uh, the only plan there is to actually lose capital value based on inflation. So you need to do an assessment of that for the long-term planning perspective. Uh, if the child is uh, not markedly restricted, they could be severely restricted in two of seven ways, or any two of seven ways, and could also then qualify as well. Now to, to check the uh, credit, uh, you would have to buy a check on line 318 of their tax return because that's where the, uh, the disability credit transferred from the child is, is used by the parent or, or by a sibling. And you should also always double check because um, if you focus solely on the child, you forget that, uh, or you don't pay attention perhaps, to the fact that when the parents came in, uh, that the mother used a cane, which means that the mother would qualify for the credit as well typically. And a lot of times people who are elderly, uh, th their infirmities have crept up on them slowly. Uh, they have tried to ignore them and they don't complain. Uh, people of a certain age are, are typically complainers. They just they get on with life. That's what they've been doing all their lives with respect to their child. What, what they do is they get up in the morning and they put one foot, one foot in front of the other and they take a step every day to walk down the path of taking care of that child. And they do this until the day they die. So you have to give them credit for the, the courage that's, that's shown. And of course, they don't know that they're, they're brave. But, but bravery really is, is action in the face of fear. And that's all they do. They, they don't even a lot of times recognize being fearful at all. The, the trepidation has been put away. Uh, but it's, it's uh, quite a, uh, a gift to be able to work with these families. The other credit that is almost never used is the caregiver tax credit. Uh, it applies uh, if the child is over 18, so let's say 28, and if they live with the parents, and if the child's income is less than 14,000 and they are dependent in some way. Now, if the disability credit has been put in place, then of course the dependence is clear. Um, but otherwise, you'd need some kind of a, a, rec a, risk, a record or a statement from a doctor to document the nature of the disability. You can't just, on, on the Schedule 5 that you use for the adjustments, you can't just put it down anymore. You have to have some documentation. Uh, but the, uh, the back filing of the caregiver credit would go, again, could go 10 years or back to age 18. And the, re the credit until recently was uh, worth about 600 a year, so the, the recapture was about 6,000. 
credit has now been increased to about a thousand a year, so it's slightly more. And, and as time goes by, of course, well, in ten years it'll be ten thousand uh, adjusted for inflation. Now, in order to do the planning, you need to know where the child is, because there will be a transition. At some point, the parents are going to die. Uh, if the child is one of the 15% that are at home until the parents fall off their perch, um, then obviously the transition is a difficult one. Uh, and it's uh, necessary at a time of great stress and uh, bereavement. So if, you, if a family can, it's best to have a, a transition sooner than that. Um, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. And in order to uh, help with that plan, you have to uh, know more about the child and, and what would be a good situation. Uh, it's very interesting as well because uh, what I've found is that quite often when the child has been at home with the parents all this time, uh, when the parents are gone, they often make great strides because they have been protected as a child is from their childhood and perhaps have not grown, grown past that. So it's very interesting to see how that happens. This just uh, speaks to the fact that the disability credit requires some assistance with food, clothing, or shelter. Um, now, we cover a lot of things at seminars, and we can't cover everything today, but um, uh, the, the, um, I think that the, the best is to talk just very briefly about Henson Trusts. Um, in order to be a correct Henson Trust, at a minimum, there has to be provisions in the, in the will, in the trust arrangements, providing that the trustee has absolute and unfettered discretion and that the asset in the trust shall not vest in the beneficiary. Uh, in a normal trust, the trustee has discretion, uh, but they could be compelled to exercise it. Uh, a Henson Trust trustee cannot be compelled. So what this means, of course, is that you have to pick carefully when you're picking the trustees. Uh, typically, uh, the trust residue after the child dies, the beneficiary dies, passes on typically uh, to their siblings. And so if the, if the siblings, the brother and sister, are the trustees and they get what's left, well, then you have to be, make sure that, uh, that the parents realize that there's a potential conflict of interest here. And generally, they look at each other and they know their kids. And they say, no, no, that's, that's fine. They'll take good care of John. Uh, but other, other times, on occasion, uh, it's clear that what you should do is throw one, of the, one or two of the cousins into the pie to, uh, to make sure that things are, are done properly and generously, or sufficiently generously. And normally in a trust, the asset of the trust beneficially belongs to the beneficiary. It's in the name of the trustee, legally speaking, but beneficially it belongs to the beneficiary. Well, in a Henson Trust, it doesn't. And what this means is it's not the child's asset. And of course, this is important. And what the, the beauty of this is that, uh, for example, these trusts can also be used where the beneficiaries are not people with special needs or disabilities. It could easily be just a trust for uh, the other son who is an accountant and uh, works for, as a chief uh, financial officer for a high tech firm, has a high income, and has a couple of young kids. Well, what you would do then, of course, is you'd consider having a trust in the parent's will for that child's share as well. And he would then be the trustee of his own trust, and he would be a beneficiary along with his two young children. And what this means as well is that the asset is, is clearly kept separate and identifiable. Uh, it's not vested in that child. And so therefore, if that child happens to divorce, it's not divisible. It's clearly not divisible. Same thing happens if you happen to set up such a trust to, to own a home for the child with, with disabilities. The trust of the home does not belong to the, the child. Uh, they have no vested interest. So therefore, if they marry and divorce, the home owned by the testamentary trust is not a matrimonial home, is not divisible. And as well, uh, in a matrimonial home, both spouses have a right, of, a right to occupy but in a, if the house is owned by a Hanson Trust, then of course the other spouse does not have a right to occupy and they could be evicted. 
So this could be a valuable asset if, uh, if the child wants to marry, but for various reasons, you know, may not stay married. Also, by the way, the, um, the home owned by the trust, whether it's a testamentary trust or an inter vivis trust, uh, it qualifies for the principal residence capital gains exemption if the beneficiary resides in it. So therefore, it could be a very good investment because it's capital gains tax-free. It's certainly better in a lot of cases than, than the parent owning it as a rental property uh, where they never make any money, and then when they die, there's a deemed disposition, the capital gains and taxes payable, plus it's part of the estate for probate value. The most recent change to the taxation of testamentary trusts is that the testamentary trusts, until just very recently, um, were taxed at beginning marginal rates of 22% on the first 40,000, and they were a separate taxpayer at a marginal rate. Uh, what's happened now is that other than trusts where the beneficiary is qualified for the disability tax credit, which is grandfathered under what's called a, a qualifying disability trust, those still have the old regime of marginal rates, but now income taxed in the hands of a testamentary trust in its own hands uh, is taxed like an inter vivos trust at the top marginal rate. So of course you must have a way to have that income declared in the hands of some taxpayer in a lower tax bracket. Now this isn't going to have a significant effect on my client families because a third to a half of them, the child does qualify for the disability credit, so it's under the old regime. And of the others, if the child is uh, not qualified for the disability credit, you can still declare income in their hands, and you can do it in such a way that it doesn't affect disability benefits. So you still have that lower tax bracket to work with. Also, a lot of the, uh, the trusts are not large trusts, 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar trust and it's invested at five percent, uh, you can give that child up to six thousand over 12 months anyway. So therefore, the 5,000 can easily be declared in their hands, uh, and you're simply supplementing them to the tune of 500 a month. This is allowed by ODSP. I think in uh, closing comments, uh, you should certainly feel free to contact me or check out my website. I'd be very happy to uh, reply to questions. Um, it's a very interesting and gratifying practice. Uh, you, you do the best you can for the clients to put their affairs in order. Uh, they get a great deal of peace of mind. Good morning, everyone. Apologize uh, in advance for a croaky voice. Uh, this is a winter cold from uh, icy Ottawa. So I'm here today to speak to you about uh, cottage or vacation home succession planning. And those of us who have been in the practice uh, of law for a number of years uh, in the wills and leaps uh, part of our practice understand that the cottage or the vacation home is the single asset which, without careful planning, is almost guaranteed to cause a war between members of the next generation. Similar to personal effects, uh, which often is the source of deep resentment, the family vacation property has an intense emotional significance uh, to our clients who feel that uh, it will be a romantic uh, uh, emotional reunion place for the, the next generation. And indeed, Clients whom you are assisting in cottage succession planning generally have on their rose-colored glasses and have the idea that uh, the succeeding generations will go hand in hand in this wonderful place that has such happy memories. It seldom works out that way, as we've all discovered. Uh, and even if the next generation of uh, family manage to navigate the shoals of equal ownership, it's a sure bet that the generation of grandchildren will find themselves uh, shipwrecked. So I've discovered that it's critical to have an open and frank discussion with the entire family to identify the expectations of the children and to learn what their objectives are. 
and then you're better placed to devise a succession plan, plan to best satisfy those objectives and accommodate competing interests. To do those, uh, one needs to take into account the following influences. Financial ability of members of the next generation, second marriages and blended families, ability to contribute physical labor, meddling in-laws, times of access, and perhaps the most important, the dynamics of the relationship between the next generation family units. Uh, this paper will attempt to uh, uh, expose you to some of my strategies to employ where the planning was either absent or ineffective to avoid dissension and resentment, and to, post, to point to some pre-death strategies which could have avoided post-death war. My first case study was an actual case in which I was involved, after the fact, I hasten to add, uh, and early in my career. Mr. Smith, a widower, had three adult children, two sons and a daughter, all married. He had a cottage in the Halliburtons, which had been in the family for two generations. His will divided everything equally among his three children with no special treatment awarded to the cottage. His children, according to Mr. Smith apparently, enjoyed a close loving relationship and Mr. Smith was of the strong view that they would all share the cottage and its happy memories well into the future. After death, the three children and their spouses established usage on a rotating basis, with each of the three couples being equally responsible for maintenance, taxes, and the usual tasks related to the opening and closing of the cottage. The first summer, John and his spouse were responsible for opening the cottage, putting in the deck, uh, putting in the dock, uh, a number of things needed repairs, boat, motor, cracked tiles in the bathroom, a broken screen door, small things, but uh, uh, things that needed attention. They opened the cottage, they looked after and paid for the repairs at their own expense, and at the end of the time, or their time in the cottage, they asked for reimbursement of the tax bill and repairs from the other two family units. Daughter Lucille, whose husband was apparently chronically unemployed, refused to pay for her share on the basis that she didn't authorize these repairs. Lucille and her husband were next on the rota of usage, and at the end of their period, Brother Martin and his spouse arrived for their allotted time to find the cottage had been left in chaos. There were unmade beds, dirty linen, rotting garbage in the guest cabin, empty liquor bottles stacked in the kitchen, and all of the screen doors were burst open, apparently from Lucille's dogs running through them. The next year, it was Lucille's turn to open the cottage, and when Brother Martin and his spouse, who were next in turn, arrived the following month, they found that the dock hadn't been put in, none of the motor boats were serviceable, and the same mess had been left that had greeted them the year before. Martin's wife was so enraged by this that she pack, packaged up all of the rotting food from the refrigerator and elsewhere and had it delivered by Purolator to Alberta to Lucille's home. Clearly, Mr. Smith's plan hadn't worked. So what could have been done prior to Mr. Smith's death to avoid this kind of toxic situation? My credo uh, is that multiple ownership of the cottage is pretty much doomed to failure. And in this case, Mr. Smith didn't take into account the financial positions and personalities of his children and their spouses. So what would I have done? Indeed, what do I do to attempt uh, to avoid this kind of situation arising in my succession plans? I would have striven to ensure that only one family unit would receive the cottage, 
and the other children's shares would be equalized by the receipt of other assets. Many clients, when you propose this, will of course say, oh my, I couldn't make a choice. My other children would never forgive me. They'll be mad at me until they go to their graves. My simple response to that consideration is to leave it to Lady Luck. If more than one child wants the cottage, let them draw straws to see which one of them will become the lucky owner. And that person has to buy the others out at fair market value. Typically, uh, they will have a proportionate interest in the estate over and above the cottage and will be able to buy out their siblings using their share of estate assets. If not, the successful, successful drawer of straws will have to finance the purchase, or if unable to do so, he or she will have to defer to the other or others of the siblings who also want the cottage. I have in my paper, which I gather you can access on a private YouTube, a precedent clause which I find very useful in avoiding the Smith family war. It has worked like a charm in the past, and I might also say in each case where I have recommended it and my advice has not been followed, there inevitably is a, a problem that arises uh, uh, along the lines of the Smith family case study. So the, the second case study is one facing one of my colleagues presently and deals with a second marriage, children of the husband slash cottage owner from a previous marriage, and children of the second wife. So Mr. Jones, the testator, knowing how much his wife loved the cottage, drew his will providing for a life interest in favor of his second wife, Maisie, with a remainder interest in favor of his children by his first marriage, passing on Maisie's death. Mr. Jones died six years ago in, in 2009, and since then, Maisie has used the cottage with her own children supporting her endeavor. Son Robert has built an addition to the cottage, looks after all of the landscaping and the numerous issues which accompany a seasonal cottage. Maisie, in turn, in accordance with the terms of her late husband's will, pays all of the expenses and the taxes and has been very generous over the years in allowing her stepchildren and their children the use of the cottage whenever they want to be there. The cottage presently has a fair market value of 1.5 million and was acquired in 1935 by way of an inheritance from Mr. Jones' father. In 1971, the valuation date for capital gains tax, it had a fair market value of $125,000. Mr. Jones failed to crystallize his capital gain in 1997 and claim his capital gains lifetime exemption, and so the present accrued capital gain is $1.375 million all of which will be taxed in the year of Maisie's death. In 2014, the federal government in its budget very unexpectedly proposed a new rule relating to the inclusion of income arising on the deemed disposition of assets in a trust following the death of a life tenant. The new section 104, subsection 13.4 will read, upon the death of a life tenant of a trust, the deemed disposition at that time will be included in life tenant's terminal return. And you heard me correctly. I said the deemed disposition will be included in the life tenant's terminal return. So in this instance, Maisie's stepchildren get the cottage, but Maisie's kids or her beneficiaries under her will get the tax bill. It's to be pointed out that this inequity will have the same effect in any assets left in a testamentary trust. 
And so we may not be able to solve the problem created inadvertently for Mr. Jones and visited upon Maisie's children, but we can do some succession planning before our testators die to avoid this result. My fix would be to provide in the will of the original testator that all uh, testamentary provisions contain a clause whereby the estate of the life tenant is indemnified by the estate of the testator for any assets exigible to capital gains tax as a result of the operation of section 104 sub 13.4. Moreover, we should all be visiting our existing wills and advising our clients who have created testamentary trusts of the effect of this proposed section. My third case study involves Mrs. Brown, who had three children and eight grandchildren. She has now died, and her will leaves the family cottage to her issue alive at her death in equal shares for Sturpees. Mrs. Brown has been predeceased by one of her sons who was survived by five children, all under the age of majority on Mrs. Brown's death. So now we have five minor children with a vested interest in one third of a piece of real estate. Since we have a vested interest in favor of minors, the cottage can't be sold without the concurrence of the court. And since the power of sale contained in the will does not override the vesting, the cottage cannot be dealt with until all five grandchildren attain their majority or until a court will order otherwise. Cottage succession is made further difficult because we have seven owners, all with competing, competing agendas, and the likelihood that none of the grandchildren have the capacity to share in the operating costs. Obviously, the only fix now that uh, Mrs. Brown has died is to sell the cottage with the concurrence of the court, or alternatively, to get permission of the court for the adult children to buy out the grandchildren's shares. This still doesn't solve the problem, of course, of the children themselves being unable to agree on the ongoing management of the cottage and could very well lead to an action for partition and sale and all of the attendant bitterness which that would most certainly produce. <clears throat> My fourth case study involves the transfer of the cottage to an inter vivos trust with a view to avoiding probate fees on the death of the settlers of the trust, in this case Fred and Diane Wright, and create a mechanism for holding investments from which the ongoing expenses will be paid, as well as a management structure for one of their children getting out of the ownership of the cottage. They visit their general practitioner lawyer who drafts a trust agreement, which accomplishes most of their objectives. What he doesn't tell them, because he doesn't know, is that because they are both under the age of 65, the transfer of the cottage to the trust creates a deemed disposition at fair market value, and the capital gains tax is exigible in the year of the transfer. Moreover, he doesn't advise them, because he doesn't know, that the trust is also subject to the 21-year deemed disposition rule for trusts, which creates a liability to capital gains tax every 21 years following the date of the creation of the trust. Finally, compounding the problem is the fact that the cottage is registered in land titles, which doesn't recognize trust ownership. And the settlor is deemed by land titles to continue to be the beneficial owner. And on the settlor's death, land titles will require probate of the settlor's will before allowing the successor trustee to deal with the cottage. So the main reason for putting the cottage into the trust was to avoid probate fees, and that purpose is not accomplished. Finally, in the Fred and Diane White situation, 
the income earned on investment monies, which were settled on the trust and intended to be used for the payment of cottage expenses, that income attracts tax at the highest marginal rate. My fix would be to avoid the trust, but what's the alternative? In this instance, um, with a view to A, avoiding probate fees, and B, creating a single unit ownership uh, uh, objective, is to create a corporation to hold title, uh, and you couple that with a shareholder agreement governing the management of the cottage and the succession of the ownership or buyout of shares. As I've said, this provides for the single ownership entity benefit and avoids the deemed disposition rule. But unless the parent is the sole owner of the shares of the corporation, i.e. the settlor, uh, or, or the, the principal of the corporation, there's no rollover available on the transfer of the cottage to the corporation and capital gains tax is due on the year of the transfer. Moreover, a corporation cannot utilize the principal residence exemption, which might otherwise be available to the settlor of the trust and or members of the next generation. And the personal use of the property could, considered, could be considered to be a taxable benefit to the shareholders and tax would have to be paid by those shareholders each year. So moving away from the case studies which illustrate the problems of cottage or vacation home succession, um, I, I, I'd like to move into the other considerations and the tools. As discussed, uh, capital gains tax is a major consideration which uh, has to be taken into account in terms of any succession planning. Uh, many vacation properties um, owned by Canadian residents are owned in the U.S. and therefore U.S. estate tax provisions must be considered. Uh, we have to consider as well uh, the estate administration tax or probate fees as we used to call them, which in Ontario presently are not only onerous in amount but the rules uh, which have been in effect since January of this year, make reporting for probate purposes much more onerous and hence expensive to our clients. Alter ego trusts are a device which may be considered as well as the ordinary inter vivos trust. As I've discussed, corporations can be uh, something that we look at to, in order to create the single ownership entity. And finally, something that is likely new to most of you is the issue of creating a nature conservancy, which I will get to in a minute. So I think I've pretty much covered the waterfront in terms of capital gains tax and uh, ways in which to minimize uh, that tax um, or defer it wherever possible. In the, on the issue of a state uh, tax, uh, as I've said, vacation properties, properties in the U.S. pose additional uh, tax and succession problems for Canadian resident owners. Uh, if your client's worldwide estate is valued at $5.34 million or less, uh, presently uh, no U.S. tax is exigible. However, if the worldwide estate exceeds $5.34 million, then there is exposure to U.S. estate tax. And it's instructive to note that for the purpose of calculating the value of the estate in the U.S., certain assets which would not be included in Canada, such as designated life insurance proceeds, are included for U.S. estate tax purposes. The, the current state of U.S. estate tax, of the U.S. estate tax regime, makes reliance on any long-term planning iffy at present. And so in terms of succession planning, uh, 
I pay more attention to the practical exigencies of the transition and less attention to the tax consequences, simply because uh, we don't know really what they are going to be at the time of the death of our client. In many situations, you would want a separate will dealing with property in the uh, foreign jurisdiction, uh, which would be written in local language and form. If you're dealing with a vacation property in Europe, uh, many of the civil jurisdictions in Europe have mandatory rules which limit the testamentary freedom of the testator and therefore your client's wishes may not be able to be complied with. So it's important if uh, this is the case, if our client has a vacation property in the south of France, we should be seeking advice from a French notary or a lawyer as to what options are available to our clients in terms of the disposition of their vacation property. Uh, we've talked about a state administration uh, tax, 1.5% uh, uh, in Ontario. Uh, and the, uh, as a consequence, if the uh, cottage or vacation property is transferred to a trust, uh, the tax savings can be significant. But at the same time, one always has to balance that against the professional fees and disbursements uh, incurred in creating the trust, as well as the potential exposure to the deemed disposition rules under the Income Tax Act. Family Law Act claims. This, of course, pertains principally to the next generation and the the outlaws, so to speak. Uh, if one of the children of your client uh, is having marital problems or may have marital problems, uh, then a trust may help to protect the cottage from the Family Law Act claims of uh, the, the spouse of, of the child. Generally, the FLA provides for the equalization of net family property and the capital value of uh, any property acquired by gift or inheritance after the date of the marriage is excluded from net family property. But where an interest is created before the marriage, the value of the interest at marriage date is deducted and the value at the date of separation is included in the calculation of net family property. Therefore, 50% of the increase or appreciation in value between marriage and separation redounds to the benefit of the in-law spouse. So when one is acting for a client who wishes to protect his or her interest in the cottage from the FLA claims by transferring the same to a trust, I try to include appropriate wording in the trust to ensure that property derived from a trust remains excluded from net family property of all beneficiaries. And I do that by permitting the trustee of the trust to exclude any beneficiary from taking an interest in the trust unless he or she enters into a marriage contract in respect of the trust property. So we've I've touched briefly on alter ego trusts and uh, alluded to the criteria for uh, uh, an effective alter ego trust uh, to avoid the deemed disposition rules. And those are, just to reiterate, that the settlor must be entitled to all of the income of the trust before his or her death and no person except the settlor before the settlor's death may receive or otherwise obtain the use of any of the income or capital of the trust. And the trust must occur, uh, sorry, the trust must be created after 1999 and the settlors or settlor must have attained the age of 65 at the time the trust was created. So the restriction that no person other than the settlor may receive or otherwise obtain the use of the income or capital of the trust before the death of the settlor 
may present a major problem if the settlor wishes his family members to have the use of the cottage, since this could jeopardize the tax deferred transfer. So I, I commend to you um, the Interpretation Bulletin 305R4, which deals with spousal trusts to which similar rules concerning capital and income apply. And that Interpretation Bulletin says that in interpreting the requirement that no person except the spouse may before the spouse's death receive or otherwise obtain the use of any income or capital of the trust, the renting of real estate at market value or the lending of money on commercial terms does not generally mean that the person renting the real estate or borrowing the money has received or has the use of that property as the term is used in this requirement. This would seem to suggest that the payment of market rent by family members would avoid the issue surrounding the settlor's use of the income and capital of the trust. However, with every avoidance, there is another pitfall. And so this may inadvertently create a change of use and a deemed disposition if the settlor is not using the cottage and may well, in any event, constitute a taxable benefit to those family members using the cottage. So there's much navigation of the shoals of the Income Tax Act in any kind of scheme relating to the rental of the cottage from the trustee of an inter vivos alter ego trust. An alternative to the alter ego trust is to create an ordinary living trust to hold the property whose beneficiaries would be the settlor and other family members. This kind of a trust doesn't qualify for the tax deferral, but would not have any restrictions on those entitled to access the income and the capital of the trust and wouldn't require the settlor to be 65 years old or older. So the choice as to whether or not an alter ego trust is going to be used as opposed to an ordinary inter vivos trust will require consideration of whether the principal residence exemption is available, and if not, the extent of the accrued capital gain, since we clearly have a deemed disposition problem with an ordinary inter vivos trust. These factors will determine whether or not the benefit of the trust, namely single entity ownership, and the ability to construct a management plan outweigh the tax consequences. Finally, it should be noted that any trust must be resident in Canada for tax purposes. We've talked about a corporation and the benefit of a corporation uh, in holding uh, ownership to a trust without the burden of the 21 year deemed disposition rule. Moreover, where there is a corporation, there's a scope for a shareholder agreement, which governs such things as management, usage, formula for annual maintenance costs, plans for capital improvements, and the transfer of shares to the next generation. Downsides are the loss of the principal residence exemption and the fact that personal use of the cottage is considered to be a taxable benefit and tax would have to be paid by the shareholders on this benefit each year. Likely an appropriate percentage of the property's fair market value. Last, I would like to touch briefly on something which for many of you uh, will be a, a, a new concept and that is the concept or the tool of creating a nature conservancy. And so if your client and his family are committed to the long-term ownership of the cottage, and this is their major objective, and they do not have a concern about maintaining and creating uh, and appreciating value to the property, they may wish to consider placing a conservation servitude of the, on the property or an easement. Uh, aside from obvious environmental benefits, 
uh, and depending upon the nature of this easement or conservation servitude, it can be a means of reducing the value of the property, lessening the effect of the capital gains tax when the property devolves to the next generation, and will also have the added benefit of reducing the municipal valuation, which will result in lower property taxes each year. Examples of such easements are ones with restrictions on building or the erection of anything that could be considered environmentally harmful, such as solar panels, wind turbines, swimming pools, etc. These easements are generally stipulated to preserve wetlands, forests, prairies, rare plants and animals, wildlife habitat, and scenic landscapes. This, of course, prevents further construction, development, subdivision, prohibitions on cutting down of healthy trees, and so on. And, of course, it significantly reduces the, 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 the fair market value of the property. A conservancy servitude can be set up through the Nature Conservancy of Canada, which requires that the property must meet certain ecological criteria. Clearly, as I've said before, these criteria have a profound effect on the value of the property as well as the marketability of same. And so given that the servitude lasts forever, your client and his or her family must be completely on side with the concept that this implies that the cottage property can never be sold and will remain in the family in perpetuity. Thus, this kind of extreme planning must be coupled with a mechanism for the ongoing management and su succession to each succeeding generation. What I've seen is a corporate structure with a shareholder agreement to which each family me member must subscribe before receiving a transfer of shares in the corporation. Corporate structure is, of course, not without the drawbacks referred to above, and these must be carefully made and analyzed to ensure that the benefits outweigh the gains. So I've attempted in this paper to provide an overview of issues which must be addressed when your clients are needing assistance in succession planning for their vacation homes. I hope I've provided some insight and oversight into the tax complexities and the practical issues pertaining to the family cottage. And uh, I would say that in my experience, clients often take the straightforward approach and don't address their minds to the bear traps of succession planning, nor do they appreciate the tax consequences. With appropriate planning, we can provide our clients with a solution that minimizes tax and meets their non-tax objectives. Moreover, we can provide valuable input to assist in aligning the non-tax objectives with a methodology which will avoid dissension in the, among the members of the next generation and will avoid the development of a toxic relationship between those members. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, here we go, talking about building and maintaining a profitable and professionally satisfying estates and succession practice. And we're going to look this afternoon at uh, the underlying principles and some best practices. Uh, I want to say good afternoon, especially to uh, the folks down east in Nova Scotia. And I understand there are some from Saskatchewan as well, uh, both of which, some of which places I've had the privilege of uh, practicing in bed and uh, certainly visiting and enjoying. So, uh, welcome all you folks down east and out west and across Ontario. This afternoon, uh, what I'd like to do, if we could, is, is really look at the high level picture in terms of uh, precedents and uh, models. There are lots and lots of excellent ones already out there, and we're not going to reinvent the wheel. What I'd like to do is, is take a uh, kind of a principled uh, approach or principled look at what a good estates practice looks like, 
what we need to do, how it's uh, developing, and where we go as we respond to, uh, to trends. So the first thing, uh, if you can follow along on my paper, the first thing we look at is the need to understand the big picture. In some ways, uh, we've, in Ontario at least, and I think right across uh, the country, uh, we've tended to follow uh, our, our British heritage in the sense that uh, this is a noble profession and that uh, barristers uh, in particular are kind of a lesser nobility. Uh, we don't worry about the money that will follow itself, but we have this noble task uh, performing in Her Majesty's courts. All of which is true and beautiful, but the truth of the matter is we all have mortgages, we all have kids to, uh, to put through school, and we all have retirements to fund, and uh, we, we do need to consider the business of the practice as well. We've always thought, I think, that the, uh, our U.S. cousins have been perhaps a little bit overly concerned about the business side, and our uh, English cousins more uh, too concerned about the, the nobility and the professional side. So. What I'm trying to do is capture a little bit of both, if we can, this afternoon. The truth of the matter is, if you don't look after the business side of your practice, then you won't be doing it for very long. If you don't do it for very long, you won't get very good at it, and you won't serve your clients. I, I frankly believe that if we uh, run better practices, more profitable practices, that that will result in better and more widespread uh, legal services for the the community. So we're going to have a look at uh, some of that this afternoon. So just considering the, the big picture is that, the, we also need to concern ourselves with the little picture and that is if we don't concern ourselves with the uh, nitty gritty of the practice, the, the forms, the intake uh, forms, the checklists, the uh, making sure that we comply with law society requirements, uh, money laundering, uh, proper uh, photo ID, all the little tiny nitty-gritty things that we sometimes uh, shove off the staff. We need to make sure that that's uh, an everyday part of our practice because it's very often the, the little things that will come back and bite us someday down the road. So big picture is extremely important, but we can never forget the, the little picture as well. Another analysis that uh, I want to just take a minute or two and, and think about this afternoon is the, uh, the difference between what I call commodity work and if you like bespoke work. Um, commodity work is if you like vending machine, cookie cutter stuff, seen one, seen them all. Uh, your typical uh, power of attorney for personal care. Uh, each of us may have our own version of it. Some people use the off the shelf uh, version. Most of us have taken the time to, uh, to modify or customize it uh, to our particular client base, but, but all of us tend to have a pretty standard boilerplate that uh, we just bang out time after time after time without uh, sometimes uh, very much thought. And that's typical commodity work. It's, uh, you, you, drop your, you drop your toonie in the vending machine, uh, bang it on the side a time or two and, and uh, hit the button and <clears throat> out drops a uh, can of, uh, of Diet Coke and away you go. And that's, that's the way a good deal of our practice really is. On the other hand, there's what you might call bespoke or tailor-made work, and these may be more complex uh, trust instruments, uh, estate planning, uh, an awful lot of, uh, of uh, estate administration work uh, would be more along the lines of tailor-made or, or bespoke work. So uh, that's important to understand that, that distinction, and some of our work will be completely at one end, some will be at the other and most of it is going to be somewhere in between. It's just simply a fact of life that commodity uh, cookie cutter work uh, tends to be more high volume, uh, low margin, and you have to do a ton of it to, uh, to make any kind of a decent living. On the other hand, in bespoke or uh, tailor-made work, uh, you can typically charge a far better hourly rate, uh, but you only get there after you've demonstrated to the community that uh, you've got the the capacity and the know-how and that you actually provide value. So more of that uh, later. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the need for standardization and systems. Now it's important to understand the difference between the two. Standardization um, is 
uh, ensuring that, that we, our material, our documentation, our checklists, our methodologies uh, follow a standard that we're not absolutely random and banging all over the place uh, so that every time we meet with clients it's a new procedure. We, we need, each of us need to develop a, uh, whether it's a, a written or a computerized or a, at the very least a mental checklist for when we are engaging with a client so that we understand uh, what needs to be picked up and how we do it and uh, ensure that by the time we get to the end of it nothing has been missed. Um, personally, in, in most of my client interviews, I, I tell them that I'm going to be doing a triage, and that is we work through uh, their particular economic and, and uh, personal uh, backgrounds so that we, we can then begin to draft and, and plan in, in a, a way that's appropriate for, for the uh, particular client. But <clears throat> that's what I mean by standardization, that, that we need to have that and more of that later. Systems, on the other hand, if you like, are the machinery that, uh, that guides and drives our standardization and uh, more of that later, but that is whether you use paper checklists, uh, whether, you, uh, whether you develop software, or you have off-the-shelf off the software, or you've built something into your practice management system, uh, that is the systems we're going to be, going to be talking about. So the, let's talk now about the fact that that we're professionals. We're um, we like to think that uh, all those folks out there that bang out wills uh, online or by computer or um, the Coles Nose versions, um, maybe they work for some people and, and maybe they don't. But but we're professionals. Uh, I'm sure you you uh, joke with clients as much as I do. I, I'm often asked at <clears throat> at uh, parties or or at uh, functions. Um, People will try me out and they'll say, "Well, listen, what's what's wrong with the uh, with a kit will, or what's wrong with having your will done online?" And uh, my answer to that typically is, uh, "They're fine. There's nothing wrong with a kit will, and they work just fine for 30 or 40 percent of the population." And of course, the uh, questioner's eyes uh, light up and, and they look all happy, and they say, "Well, which 30 or 40 percent?" And my answer to that is, "We won't know until we can actually sit down in my office." And, uh, and do the triage and go through your affairs and then maybe by the time you've paid for an hour or an hour and a half of my time, then you can go and use a kit uh, and maybe you need me to, uh, to tailor make it for you. So um, that's the edge that we have and we have to keep focused on that as, as lawyers that, that uh, we're professionals, we've studied, we specialized, uh, we continue to upgrade our, our uh, qualifications and our, our knowledge, continue to read, uh, we go to conferences, and ideally, or hopefully, we, we all find ourselves becoming sharper and better at what we do, uh, and that's our professional edge. What do we bring to the table? Uh, perception. Um, I'm sure most of you are are uh, a dozen years out or 20 years out or whatever. I'm 33, although you never guess it. I, I know I look much younger than that, but uh, what, what, what do we learn? We, we just develop instincts and uh, perceptions that only come from experience. So we have that advantage. Uh, creativity, the fact that we're practicing in, in a states and succession law uh, suggests to me that, that we have to be creative. Uh, we have a different skill set than, uh, for instance, the, um, the litigator, the IP professional. Um, we need, if we're going to be successful in this, we need to be able to create uh, sometimes very flexible uh, documents that, that will wrap around a particular thorny uh, client issue, maybe a family issue, uh, and, and we need to be able to, to have that creativity. And vision's important as well, uh, and that is we, we can have a client come to us with a problem that's either economic or, uh, or family driven or something of that nature without the uh, ability to be able to, to envisage uh, after probably a lot of struggle, reading, um, occasionally something pops into your mind in the middle of the night, I'm sure you've all experienced that. Sometimes uh, you get up in the morning, it's not such a great idea, but most of the time these uh, things that pop in from your subconscious have been bubbling along in the uh, in your decades of experience and practice, 
and uh, that that's where the creativity and the and the vision comes from. So let's talk about the pillars of the practice as we move down the the notes. First thing that all of us have to understand is we face rules of professional conduct. Uh, no matter what province we're in, if uh, those those of you down in Nova Scotia, the uh, NSLC, uh, no, I'm sorry, that's Electric Control Board, let me get this right, the um, barrister, NSBS, um, I'm terribly sorry about that. <clears throat> Never confuse lawyers and alcohol, that just wouldn't do. But uh, the NSBS has, has a set of rules. Our Law Society of Upper Canada has a set of rules, and uh, in Saskatchewan, similarly, you have the rules of professional conduct, and most of them are. Um, Concord well with the with the uh, model <clears throat> of the Canadian Bar Association. So we have to understand that <clears throat> we live or die by these rules, and in fact, we could find ourselves disciplined or uh, ultimately disbarred if we don't. So let's think about those very briefly for a moment. Uh, I'm going to refer to the Ontario Law Society uh, of Upper Canada, but they're pretty consistent across the country, and. Let me just hit a couple of items from uh, Ontario's uh, Chapter 3, Relationship to Clients, uh, Rule 3.1-1, and in particular H, I, J, and K. Um, H, it's, it's a standard that says we must recognize the limitations in our ability to handle a matter or some aspect of it, and taking steps accordingly to ensure the client is appropriately served. In other words, it's, it is a breach of our standards uh, if we're in over our heads. If you're unable to handle the matter competently and confidently and appropriately, then simply don't do it. Um, the next one is interesting, managing one's practice effectively. In other words, we are required to run a tight practice, and if we're not effective, then we're in breach. And pursuing appropriate professional development to maintain and enhance legal knowledge and skills. Notice it's not just the knowledge, but it's also the skills, which is, I guess, why um, you're watching and I'm talking, and we're all learning, hopefully, together on this. Um, to be blunt, when you make these presentations, you learn one heck of a lot when you're preparing for it. But the professional development to maintain and enhance the knowledge and skills is not just a nice idea, it's a requirement. <clears throat> and finally, otherwise, adapting to changing professional requirements, standards, techniques, and practices. And ladies and gentlemen, if there's any area of the law which is evolving at a, uh, an incredible pace, it's the law of uh, estates and trusts. Uh, let's face it, uh, we are in the middle of the, the baby boom uh, aging, the, uh, the mega billion dollar transfer of wealth from our parents to our generation, and it's, um, it's, it's a tidal wave that's hitting us, and the law changes extremely rapidly. So it's, it's hard work uh, to keep up with it, and if you're not prepared to do it, then frankly, you should find some other area of practice. Uh, it's, Perhaps it goes without saying, one, one of the problems in our area of practice, one of the unique issues in our area of practice, is that you don't get a second chance to fix things because uh, more typically than not, uh, the individual for whom you planned, uh, when we find out that the plan is not uh, working or that there was a, a terrible typo or you missed something or there's some allegation that uh, that, that you weren't quite up to par. The problem is that the individual is either dead or incapacitated and uh, therefore your, your key witness uh, is gone and there's no ability, uh, frankly, to fix it. Uh, certainly with British Columbia's Wills Variation Act and statutes of that sort, which we're slowly moving toward, you may get a chance to fix it. And I know the courts love to try, but but the problem is you just don't have the original um, uh, instructor, whether the testator or the grantor of power of attorney just isn't there anymore, so, or at least not there uh, with any capacity. So in our area of practice, you really do have to get it right first time around. 
and that is why we, we <clears throat> have to be so finicky, if you like, about our, our practice and our, our methodologies. So those are the rules of professional conduct. Uh, they're there and they're very real. But I think if there's a single rule that we all should keep pasted on our wallet, something like this, and that is practice to the level that you will have wished uh, that you practiced uh, in the event you find yourself a defendant. So when the day comes, as it probably will for all of us, when our drafting uh, and instruction taking is taken into question and uh, our file is produced for uh, law pro or, or um, whichever your professional insurance is, then at that point in time you're going to hope that your file is fulsome and thorough and uh, well documented and the issue in question, the negligence of which you've been uh, accused, uh, is, <clears throat> is seen to be, uh, uh, have no substance to it because your paper, your, your file is well papered and documented. So if there's a golden rule, practice to the level you will wish you had when you are defended. Uh, pray that never happens, but uh, that's the way to practice. Let's move on to the ethical, the fiduciary, and the moral realities. The truth of the matter is this, that as, as our noble profession, our, our standards, if you like, have to go beyond our professional uh, duties uh, under the rules of professional conduct. Some of them are simply moral realities that uh, <clears throat> uh, this is where pro bono sometimes comes in. This is where um, part of our practice is if you get a call for someone who wants to change the will and they're uh, frankly, in their last hours of life, um, if, uh, if you intend to be in this, this business, this practice, then you simply get in your car and you drive over to the hospital and uh, you meet this individual. The other lesson, I'm sure you've all uh, been there as well, uh, it's just occurring to me, I'm just rambling on here. I, uh, it's far better to have a live audience. I can see reactions, so I'm just guessing everybody out there is still awake. But uh, moral realities, uh, one of the things I learned a decade, decade and a half ago is that although I've got a gorgeous 15-page uh, will that uh, impresses everybody and, and it's just great, but the person who is a literally dying, um, uh, somebody that's dying of cancer and, and they're full of morphine and they're doing all they can to hang on and be with you, really don't want to go through a 16-page will and initial every page and sign at the end. They just physically can't handle it and it's cruel to, to put them through that. So case in point, um, after having gone through that once, I went back to the office and said, listen, can, can I take my 16-page um, will and reduce it to a page and a half? And um, in fact, did that and moved up to about a 16, um, 16 paid or so, sorry, 16 uh, point pitch, so it's easier to read. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. The moral realities are tailoring to the the physical or um, emotional or mental needs of of the particular client. Um, so I guess we're going to go off air just for a second here. So, Let's talk about the business realities, as I alluded earlier. If you can't make a living, and a good living, at the practice, then what happens? You're going to start to take shortcuts, you're going to, uh, you're going to find yourself getting overwhelmed at work, you're going to find yourself not getting back to people, and before you know it, you're going to have a crisis and uh, eventually have to shut down your practice or have somebody shut it down for you. So. The, the truth of the matter is that we do need to think as business people, not because we're here necessarily to, to get uh, very, very wealthy, but the truth of the matter is if we're not successful business people and we can't make a decent living, then we are not going to keep the doors open and do a good job for any period of time. So we need to focus on these business realities. So what are some of the keys of running a successful practice? Let's just run through these. Quickly, it has to be effective. In other words, we need to uh, produce the work which has an effective result or a useful result, if you like, to the client. The client comes to us with a problem uh, or a situation or an issue 
that frankly they may not even fully understand. They just know that they have an angst about something, but they don't really understand uh, what is relevant, who are the players, what their legal issues are, what, uh, what the outcomes may be, what the future has for them. Because of our training, because of our experience, because of what we do, um, we're able to drill down into that and begin to analyze their problems <clears throat> and begin to work toward a solution. Uh, and I'm going to suggest it has to be a solution that the client understands and they're on our wavelength about more of that later. So it has to be effective. We actually have to do something good and useful for our clients. They, they need to get their money's worth. That's what I mean by uh, we have to be effective. <clears throat> we have to be efficient, and that is we have to be able to get to that result uh, with, a, um, with a reasonable amount of effort. If we expend too much effort, we're either going to be uh, billing ourselves at a range, charging people too much, or um, on the other hand, squeezing our own personal profit margin uh, such that we're not, we're not making any money. So we have to be efficient <clears throat> so that we get a good product out the door at a fair cost uh, and a reasonable profit. Uh, as well, it has to be risk averse, and that is <clears throat> we do not want to ever find ourselves uh, as a defendant um, or even uh, have ourselves under the spotlight. Uh, you and I all have had colleagues who have found themselves under the spotlight of, of our various law societies, <clears throat> and it, it's, a, it's a horrible place to be. Uh, you find yourself wasting uh, literally days and days and sleepless night after sleepless night. It's, it's just no place to be. So we always need to be risk averse and be watching for that, uh, that thin spot in the ice to make sure we don't even get near it. The practice needs to be reputable. And I mean that in both senses of the word. That is, we, uh, we need to have an, a reputation for integrity, uh, for hard work, uh, for being fair and square with our clients, but uh, reputable in the sense that uh, we need to be of good professional reputation as well, and that is we need to be recognized in our local communities, our local legal communities, as being very good at what we do. Uh, the test of that very often is that um, when you begin to see a flow of work from accountants and, and uh, financial planners and uh, perhaps general practice lawyers and your partners around the firm, when you see people sending you good and interesting cases uh, as a routine matter, then I think you can say that your reputation has, uh, has established something. But reputation is not something you take for granted or, or uh, rest in your laurels. It's something you have to continually burnish and protect and, uh, and continually uh, enhance it. Because quite frankly, uh, there's a crowd moving in behind you who will eat your lunch if you can't keep it at the, uh, the head of the pack. So that's a reputable practice. And finally, it needs to be measurable. Uh, a good friend of mine says, you can't manage what you don't measure. And uh, essentially, uh, you, you need to know how much uh, time input, cost input, staff input, uh, how much of your overhead is going into the production of a simple will, simple power of attorney, a uh, family trust, a complex planning situation. All of these things need to be measurable uh, so that you can manage them and, and make your practice more effective, more efficient, and more profitable, and frankly, do a better job for people. Let's talk about the structure of the practice, moving along. Uh, why does structure and management matter? I think uh, I've said it in several different ways now that if your um, practice is not uh, well managed, it'll go off the rails and take you down with it, which really is not good for anybody. So to be efficient, uh, risk averse, reputable, and uh, measurable, we need structure and management. Maximizing profit, let's talk briefly about that. <clears throat> and I, I've listed a number of things and it won't be much more than just touch on them. So first of all, your, your practice needs to be client-centric, and that is at the end of the day, the client is the, that has to be the focus uh, of everything we do. We have to worry about them. They have to know that they're welcome, that we're paying attention to them, we're listening, uh, that we're communicating with them. And it's much, uh, much as a client, a friend of mine has said that a happy client is a good client, and, and a happy client is a, is a profitable client. So 
you have to work very hard at putting them in and letting the client know they're at the center of your practice. Managing the solicitor-client relationship, we've had many talks about uh, this within our within our practice group at uh, Low Merchants and Radnoff, but the, the, the real issue here is that the you can't let the client run the relationship. The lawyer uh, and the lawyer's staff need to manage the solicitor-client relationship to make sure everybody understands the game rules, everybody understands the monetary implications all the time, and that uh, as we're moving through the, uh, the client care process, that they understand uh, what we're doing for them and how we're doing it and why we're doing it and when it's going to happen. Uh, an informed client typically is, is a happy client. Understanding the life cycle of a file, again, is, is something that we try to come back to again and again in our practice group, and that is from the initial phone call to the final report, uh, there needs to be a clear understanding of what we call the life cycle and every step in it. And it's a cycle because every well-handled file leads to another one or perhaps another five or six. Uh, there's, nothing, uh, there's nothing quite like a well-managed solicitor-client relationship and satisfactory uh, work done for a client to build that practice. They send their friends and relatives and people they work with uh, will come to you if they are happy and they're satisfied with the caliber of the work that you've done for them. And you've got to take the time to let them understand that. Not that you're bragging, not that uh, that's all you do, but it's important that the client, um, by the time they leave the door and they receive your report, that they fully understand what, uh, what's just gone on, that it's not a mystery to them. <clears throat> We've talked about measuring and managing, honing the skills that is taking, uh, taking PD just as we're doing now, um, reading. Um, I'm sure all of you, uh, you know, keep a copy of the law reports kicking around somewhere, um, and you read it, and your spouses and your kids probably think you're out of your mind, but uh, honing the skills is a constant, ongoing process, whether it's 10 minutes a day or an hour a day. Um, we continually have to uh, sharpen our skills. Knowledge management, again, it's uh, wonderful to, uh, to take these, uh, these courses and to read the material and to have the books, but if you can't put your fingers on something, then uh, you become inefficient. So you need, whether it's an indexing program, whether it's a librarian if you're in a larger firm, somehow, somewhere, you need to be sure that if you have a question, you can put your fingers on the answer uh, in, in a short and efficient period of time. That's what knowledge man management is all about. Uh, and I'll leave it at that because there are full courses on it. Precedents we're going to get to later. And then again, uh, accountants are far better at this than lawyers, but getting the right people doing the right work at the right level. Um, uh, my contention is within the practice of law, we have far too much uh, lawyers doing work that really should be done by a clerk um, and yet it needs to be administered so I don't want to get down that rabbit trail but um, as a profession we need to make sure that we're having work done efficiently at exactly the right level and not uh, over that. That <clears throat> very much goes to reasonable legal costs to, to the general public. Working with other professionals in our practice area of, of states and trusts very much we find ourselves working with typically accountants and uh, similarly with financial planners and we need to learn something about their practice and their business and we need to know enough so that we can carry on a, a meaningful conversation, understand their language and translate ours. System and systems is the difference. The system is the overall um, framework if you like and systems would be the, the gears within the machine and bringing that all together. If I had all afternoon, I'd drill into that a little more, but I see our time is starting to run. Uh, just a, a nod toward the website. The website can be more than just a brochure. Um, it's an opportunity to showcase your personal expertise, your competence, and it's also important, I think, that you demonstrate your caring. The clients uh, will come to you saying, you know what, I, th I think you you really do care about your clients and you've got a soft spot for me. That's, that's important to communicate that. 
your, your website can also be an integral part of the client information package. You don't have to uh, print out uh, documents and, and brochures for your client. That can all be available to them online. I know everybody says, well, if I put it online, then all my colleagues and all of the, uh, uh, the do-it-yourselfers are going to steal from it and use that. And I suppose that's true, but uh, they're going to find it somewhere else. Uh, your client information, your informed client is a safer client, uh, a happier client, a more satisfied client. And if they think they're getting something for free on your website, uh, they're, going to, uh, they're going to feel that's worth a lot. So your website can be a great place to uh, pump out information to your clients. And then at some level, uh, lawyer-client interaction, uh, frankly, we're not there yet, but we're investigating it. Um, so that we can uh, pass draft documents back and forth. Uh, I'm quite jealous of my accountant because he's doing that. <clears throat> We're not quite there yet. I'm going to skip uh, blogs and, and all of those things. Um, I'm sure you've got thoughts about that. Ta let's talk about building for tomorrow. And this is reputation building for yourself and for your practice group and for your firm. Um, it's important that we continually burnish our reputation um, for knowledge, for competence, uh, for caring, uh, for being thorough, for getting the job done, for reporting back to the uh, sender, if, if it's an accountant or a financial planner. Your reputation is built on, on a thousand tiny steps and we can't just miss any of those. <clears throat> the last item I have there is going the extra mile. Um, the, the five or ten minutes you take to to uh, go the extra mile with a client or a sender um, is worth uh, any number of uh, promotional pages that you might otherwise go out and buy. Uh, item B, Kaizen, continuous improvement, um, is basically the, the uh, practice that the Japanese developed back in the 60s and 70s within their factories, uh, which sort of put them at the forefront. But it's just a notion of continuous improvement. Everything you do, always look for a way to make it a little better uh, next time around. <coughs> Item C, skating to where the puck is going to be. I think this was Wayne Gretzky. And the notion is that uh, you can't, when you're, when you're getting ready for future developments, you can't just um, say, you know, I, I'm good enough for today. But we need to be good enough for tomorrow. We need to be looking at demographic trends. We need to be looking at uh, legal trends what's happening in other common law jurisdictions, in fact, other jurisdictions, and be ready when that happens in our jurisdiction, whether it's Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Ontario, or wherever, uh, we need to be ready for that. So that's part of our being a high-level professional. Let me skip down because our time is running. Uh, pricing, how do we set pricing? Um, there are, I think, two thoughts on this. <clears throat> uh, really, it's what will the market bear? And that breaks down into the unsophisticated client, the person that's going to go down to, uh, going to, go down to uh, chapters or uh, staples and buy the kit, do it themselves. Um, you have to decide if you're going to attempt to bid against that. Somebody that can go online or somebody that can, can go to a Walmart and get a will done for 99 bucks. Do you want to compete against that? Should you compete against that? Can you compete against that? And you just have to make that personal decision. If you think you can, God bless you, go for it. I'm not going to try. Um, so for the unsophisticated client, you have to educate them a little bit to know that for 99 bucks, um, they're not going to have anybody pay much attention. For 29 bucks, they can do it themselves and they have no idea uh, whether this fits them or not. But um, <clears throat> I sometimes say to folks like that, uh, be my guest, go for the kit because frankly, I'm going to make a whole lot more money on you after you die. <clears throat> and at that point, they, about half the time they then make an appointment to come and see me. <clears throat> so the unsophisticated client, how badly do you really want to, uh, to die from the bottom of the barrel and get the, the $99 uh, people coming to your door? The sophisticated client is more likely to buy, be a high net worth individual they're more likely going to be appreciative of tax saving, uh, of uh, estate efficiencies, of uh, looking after particular uh, family issues, 
uh, whether it be the disabled adult child or, or what have you. But the sophisticated client, properly educated, is much more ready to pay you a fair uh, fee for good work. And I would suggest that's the kind of client that you really want to target um, first and foremost. Costs, again, that's a discussion with your accounting department. Um, and I see I have five minutes left, so I'm going to skip along quickly. Um, if there's no profit, is there a business case? And you can read for yourself, but you need to ask yourself that question. Um, all right, we have another large area to skip through quickly, and that is establishing and maintaining the solicitor client relationship. Know your client, uh, the points there you can read as well as I can, uh, and particularly little D1 vulnerable client. Be really very careful of the client who's brought in by a family member. I know lots of times uh, mom hasn't been driving for years or never has, somebody has to drive her in. Do you let the daughter, who might be overbearing, come into the meeting room with you? Uh, what happens, <clears throat> especially are you watching out for signs of what I call a predatory relationship? Are there language barriers? Uh, does the daughter have to translate for mom or dad? Um, are they translating honestly and fairly? Um, do, are you prepared? What's going, what are the notes in your file going to be? if it's a translation situation and you don't know the, the language. Don't have time to get into it, but it's something we have to be very alive to. Sensory defects, uh, hearing, vision, um, <clears throat> and things of that nature. And one of the questions too is, is your office, uh, uh, is it designed to, to, um, uh, to cater to or to uh, make accommodation for people who have sensory uh, deficits? The joint retainer, uh, there's a good deal of discussion about that and we need to pay attention. Uh, the overly priced conscious. In my 33 years of practice, my experience has been that uh, people that quibble at every second line about the cost <clears throat> are not going to be happy. Um, you are almost certainly going to have trouble uh, when you're finished with it. You may not get paid. Uh, I find typically uh, the shoppers, uh, I usually find a way to avoid uh, dealing with them because you just can't make them happy. <clears throat> I find the clients that are vague or evasive or delaying are going to be trouble. Uh, the client who is too good to be true is going to be trouble. And then finally, sometimes you just can't put your finger on it, but if your spidey senses are saying to you, there's something about this client that gives me the willies, um, I'm not above uh, suggesting that perhaps I'm just not the, the right person for this job. In the couple of minutes we have left, I wanted to skip down to know the case. Uh, this is incredibly important. You really need to know the client's proposition. You cannot assume anything. <clears throat> you really need to drill down into the, uh, into the client's world and know it well and make sure that the client and yourself understand what you think you understand. So uh, if you have to repeat it a couple of times and go through your notes with the client, it's incredibly important to make sure that you, you understand the client's proposition and they know you do and you know that they know that you do. Um, there are a lot of issues in your triage process. You can take the client's word. If they tell you they've got $250,000 in RSPs, you can probably take their word for it. If they say that they think uh, their tenants in common <clears throat> to Andy's cottage, but they're not sure, then you certainly should be doing a title search so that uh, so that you're sure of that because your your planning can be completely off the mark if you get that one wrong. How are we doing for time? A minute or two? Okay. So we're. Um, so there's the initial synchronization with the client, and then keeping synchronized with the client all the way through so that the reporting letter is something that when they get it, they're basically reading what they already know, but that's your, that's your safety. Uh, ensuring you're going to get paid, <clears throat> I'm going to skip over that. Uh, ensuring that it's a record. Um, why do you need to have a good file record of your, your client inter interaction, your professional activity? Because if you ever get sued, you're going to want to have it. Uh, you, well, let's talk about paper and electronic. Our firm, like many, is becoming more and more 
paper less, uh, although we'll never get rid of the stuff, <clears throat> and more and more electronic so that uh, the entire file can be retrieved quickly and uh, usefully, and that quite often ends a question right there. File closing protocol, uh, hopefully you and your firm have a thorough method that uh, your file just doesn't get shoved off into the corner of the office and sometime down the road uh, you, you worry about it. And how are we doing for time? Two, three, a couple of minutes? Okay. Um, how long do you keep the file? That's your particular law society. Sound and video recording. There are cases, I, I, I know some counsel uh, literally video record every client interview in the state's matters. I don't, perhaps should, but there are some where it's crying out, particularly if there's any, um, what you might think is an unusual distribution of the estate or something of that sort, <clears throat> strongly recommend that that be video recorded. And uh, I'm being told that we're down to a matter of seconds. Um, there may be some questions, and if we can't answer them on air, uh, if they can get emailed to me, I'll, I'll try to get back to you. And I guess we're out of time? We're out of time. Thanks very much. The, well, the topic is uh, wills and estates law in cross-border situations. Uh, and the uh, topic is one of some complication. And the way I will present it as, is uh, as follows in an effort to simplify it in 45 minutes. For one, you see the paper before you as I speak. Uh, and in particular, it is uh, Presentation A, uh, which is found uh, on the uh, main page uh, of the Common uh, Commons Institute regarding my presentation. Uh, present, presentation B uh, consists of the main, uh, and C, I should say, consists of the main authorities which I will be referring to, namely the EU regulation on succession matters and the Convention on International Wills. Um, <clears throat> the three written materials are intended to be reasonably self-contained uh, uh, in, in that uh, by looking at all of them uh, you will be able to uh, come to grips with issues here at hand uh, when you encounter them in your practice. Uh, although Ontario and Germany are singled out in comparison for reasons of accuracy, much of what I say also applies to other provinces of Canada and to other countries of Europe. Implicit in what I'm saying is that although both Canada and Germany are federal states, in Canada matters of succession are under provincial and in Germany under federal jurisdiction. My oral presentation um, will basically follow the order of my paper, but I will not read from it uh, or even point to it, uh, but rather uh, succinctly state the main points made in it, so that my oral presentation is in a sense something in addition and separate. Um, nonetheless, I will have to refer to my notes regarding the oral presentation also because uh, the points I will be making are rather exacting in nature. Anyone in the in the audience, however, uh, could follow along in the paper, and here and there I will give an indication on what page I am in the paper. If there's an unclarity or an, an inconsistency between the written and oral presentation, the written presentation, uh, of course, uh, uh, will prevail, it being more exacting still. Now, first, uh, in the introduction, there is a technical problem in scrolling uh, um, down. Um, yes, uh, you will see now on the screen the index and uh, uh, I'm now on page three regarding the introduction and I will be brief regarding that. Uh, we are all uh, experiencing rapid changes uh, due to growing accessibility, mobility and immigration uh, uh, issues and the law must adapt to these. Uh, significant challenges can arise with, with regard to cross-border cases 
and I will deal with some uh, of the main challenges uh, in the course of this presentation. Uh, the most important issues, uh, to get right to the point, are uh, the applicable law and secondly, the recognition of wills. As I get into more detail, these terms and words will gain uh, in meaning. Um, to repeat, the main examples are uh, Ontario and Germany, and let me focus first on the main differences. First, of course, uh, uh, Ontario has a common law regime and Germany has a civil law regime, and their commonalities among the common law system and among the civil system um, and uh, whatever differences I make in regard there to uh, is shared uh, by other countries. Then of course, uh, and this is rather important, uh, there's a difference of language. German is the only official language uh, of Germany but English and French are, are actually the most official languages uh, of the EU or the originally official languages. Now all countries can use their own language. Uh, and, but certainly as far as the court system of Germany is concerned, uh, German must be used and that is a barrier and uh, adds a complication. And of course there are quite a number of other languages in Europe uh, which also add uh, to this added difficulty. Um, Second, uh, thirdly, there is no mandatory requirement for an estate trustee in Germany. There may be one, but does not have to be one. In the common law system, there has to be one. It used to be called executor and uh, administrator. Uh, but in Germany, basically, uh, an estate devolves to all heirs at the point of death, although there, as in uh, Canada generally, uh, this devolution has to be recognized by the courts um, and there is what is called a community of heirs and for the most part that community of heirs acts on its own without any representative although they may have a lawyer of course but there's nothing of the sort of an estate trustee this being a major difference a further difference uh, between uh, Germany and uh, Ontario is uh, that uh, Germany has a compulsory share regime. This basically comes from the Roman law and uh, very close relatives, mainly children and spouses, must inherit whether they're in the will or not. And uh, it is dangerous uh, not to keep that in mind when one reads uh, German wills and uh, certainly complications can arise in conflict of law situations in this regard and it's the compulsory share can be as much as one half of the estate and we're talking about something very significant. Uh, a further difference is that uh, the heir inherits the liabilities of the estate, something quite unknown to the common law world uh, and before one takes on an estate one really has to ensure that one doesn't inherit mere liabilities. Now, the safest way to avoid problems is to do careful planning and to be circumspect. Uh, and a will uh, with choice of law and secondly forum clauses uh, should be uh, uh, prepared if it may be prepared. I will return to this later. Uh, Deciding on your own what choice of law and form to apply solves many problems. And uh, as you will see from the uh, present, uh, presently uh, in force already EU regulation, uh, that is one of the main aims of the regulation. And in some ways, although dealing with a very complicated subject, it succeeds in simplifying it. As I said, a regard must be had to the, need, to the new EU legislation for private international law or conflict of law regarding the succession, which will become effective completely in the summer of uh, 2015. Uh, it, this regulation significantly changes the conflict of law rules for 25 of the present 28 member states of the EU, and I will refer to that regulation in the second uh, 
part of my presentation uh, and it makes up presentation B which is part of the package and uh, the whole regulation consisting of some 42 pages is reproduced verbatim and is of course the authoritative text for it and I'm seeking uh, to uh, ease uh, uh, an understanding of it. Now, if, I, if we speak generally about uh, uh, both Ontario and Germany, uh, two basic questions arise, namely one, jurisdiction, and two, the applicable law. And more specifically, the general questions are as follows, which court has jurisdiction over the matter. And uh, distinct from that question is whose national law is to be applied to the estate. And the answer is to be determined really on the basis of looking at both Canadian and German law uh, to get the whole picture. Common law lawyers sometimes think that they only have to look at the common law to decide upon conflict rules and certainly uh, civilian lawyers do the same and see everything from their perspective but I'm afraid that's wrong and a, a common error which occurs which everyone should avoid. Um, now I'm aware that uh, we lawyers are licensed uh, and insured for what we are uh, Nonetheless, uh, these uh, realities also will have to adapt to the new situation. As you know, it is already adapting in that there are mobility rules across Canada, which now uh, nearly include Quebec. Uh, and uh, as the world gets still smaller, uh, we also will have to adapt to the uh, situation now with Europe. And as you know, uh, there is a free trade agreement uh, which is already initials, initialed and which uh, is expected to be in effect in about two years, which will involve very major changes in trade relations, but also in uh, sociological and uh, cultural uh, relations, uh, including legal uh, uh, relations. Now, uh, let us, uh, these questions apply to both Germany and Ontario. Now let us look at, at the question of jurisdiction of a court in Ontario. Um, and Ontario divides, uh, does not divide, I should say, jurisdiction uh, between contentious matters and non-contentious matters. But it, once you proceed in a, in a court in Ontario, it also looks at the contentious matters which may arise. Uh, and of course in Ontario the local court uh, of the place in which the testator died uh, has jurisdiction. Uh, Germany, however, divides between contentious proceedings and uh, non-contentious matters. And let me look at first contentious uh, proceedings. Uh, the court in which a defendant has his general venue uh, is the court which has jurisdiction and the general venue is determined uh, by the place of residence. Also, for certain estate matters, uh, the testator's general venue at the time of his death may be considered. And there may be a choice of form by written agreement between the parties uh, if at least one of them has no general venue in Germany. Now, regarding non-contentious matters, the courts have international ju jurisdiction uh, when a court has uh, local competence. And uh, as far as local jurisdiction is concerned, the probate court is at the place of the testator's last habitual residence. Uh, and if there is no habitual residence, then it's a certain court in Berlin which has uh, jurisdiction. And if a, a testator was not a German citizen and did not live in Germany, the court at the location of the assets located in Germany is locally competent. And secondly, we get to the question of applicable law. First, you look at what court has jurisdiction, but it does not follow that that court applies its own law. It may apply some other law. Uh, and in this regard, uh, the situation in Ontario is as follows. Uh, regarding mo movables, the law is uh, the place of the testator's domicile. 
and this leads to uh, considerable problems in both Ontario and Germany. Uh, now, movables may often be bank accounts, and uh, Ontario uh, estates, for instance, want uh, money from a German bank, and the German bank then says, well, prove to us, according to German law, that you're entitled to this, and may insist that you bring a proceeding, a court proceeding in Germany obviously adding to the expense uh, of the proceeding. And likewise, uh, uh, when uh, Germans want uh, bank accounts uh, uh, transferred in Canada, uh, at least uh, in it's my experience in Ontario that not seldom a bank will insist that there be an order uh, presented um, or handed down by an Ontario court thus defeating really the ease of the whole regime, but that is the reality one has to face. Um, even as far as immovables are concerned, as far as, uh, even as far as movables are concerned, as far as immovables are concerned, the law of the country where the property is located in uh, governs. And not seldom one will have um, assets uh, in the other country dealt with from uh, one's own country and one has to keep in mind the uh, law of the place uh, about, one, about which one uh, is uh, devising real property and it is the real property law of uh, the, uh, in Canada the province and in, in Germany uh, uh, of the jurisdiction where the, the real property is located and frankly one has to take into account such as, for example, uh, there are cases uh, of holograph wills, which are rather simple wills, which are legal in Germany, which devise a property, say, in Alberta. And uh, then the Alberta court says, well, you have not followed sufficient formality to do that. And uh, the device may even fail, and therefore one has to carefully consider also the law of the jurisdiction uh, where the uh, property is located. Um, for instance, a German citizen domiciled in Ontario was property in Germany. Uh, Ontario law will be applied to movables and immovables located in Ontario. German law will be applied to immovables located in Germany. <coughs> now I get to the question of validity of wills, and many of these terms use ordinary English, but there is, they're laden with technical meaning. And validity of wills in Ontario um, are uh, divided into formal validity and the construction and material validity in, in Ontario. As far as the formal validity is concerned, uh, when it comes to an interest in land, the formal validity is, as I said, governed by the lex situs, that is to say the law where the property is situated. Um, and. Uh, even though there is an Ontario will, if there is property outside Ontario, it is a law of that property outside, an Ontario, outside Ontario, which must be considered in the Ontario will. And whether that's a wise thing to do, I'll cover later. It's, it may be unwise. But it, it is, in fact, often done uh, to the chagrin of uh, the persons uh, so proceeding. Um, as far as the interest in movables is concerned, the law of the place where the testator was domiciled at the time of his death governs. And as I said, uh, uh, the law is reasonably clear in that regard that its execution or, or actually getting other uh, authorities outside the country to follow the law of Ontario that, that this regard is very difficult. And, and frankly, if a bank refuses, what are you going to do? What are you going to do about it? But rather to comply with the requirements of the bank, uh, which is really inconsistent with the law of Ontario. But they are masters of their own house. A will is also valid in Ontario, but at the time of its making, it uh, complied with either of the following: the law of the place it was made, the law at the testator's domicile the law at the testator's habitual residence, or the law of the country of which the testator was a national, if there was in fact uh, a, pl a place one 
was in that place one body of law governing the wills of nationals. And now I'll turn to the construction uh, and the material validity uh, of wills in Ontario. And as for construction, all issues concerning the meaning and interpretation, uh, the law of the testator's residence at the time of making the will governs, and Ontario does, law, does allow choice of law in this regard. As for the material validity uh, from an Ontario perspective, as I said before, for movables the law of the testator's domicile, and for immovables the law of the situs. We now turn to uh, Germany regarding the applicable law and how it deals with such questions. First, as to succession. The law of the country of which the deceased was a national at the time of his death uh, governs. Generally, Germany goes by citizenship where uh, we Canadians go by residence. Uh, but uh, as far as a new EU regulation is concerned, it trying to get away from uh, these independent nation states, it also goes more to habitual residence rather than nationality. Um, and uh, I'll turn to that later. A further basic principle of, a ter of German law is the uniformity of the, of the estate. There is no such distinction as in Ontario between immovables and movables and the different treatment of them. That probably is a simple way, and that is certainly the way the new EU regulation is uh, uh, heading for. Um, there's an exception here. Uh, the testator may choose German law for immovables, which uh, are located in Germany. And uh, Germany it does uh, follow grand roi. Uh, that is to say, if a referral is made to the law of the other country that other countries' private international deems German law applicable, German law accepts the referral. For, for example, you could have a situation where a German citizen dies domiciled in Germany. According to German law, law of his home province, Ontario, is applicable to succession, but Ontario law deems German law act applicable to the movables before, be, because of the domicile in Germany. As you can see here, Ontario law can also deal with domicile in Germany. And therefore, uh, this referral is accepted by the German courts and would, uh, the Germans would apply uh, law of movables and mo immovables located in Germany. Uh, it always applies according to uh, on, um, Ontario law uh, to uh, immovables which are located in Germany anyway. German law does not currently allow for a choice of the applicable law by the testator except for immovables located in Germany. But the e new EU regulation expands that. You see how or in which direction which we are heading. Uh, as for the validity of wills in Germany, a will is valid if its, for if its form complies with the formal requirement of any of the following laws. Uh, one, the law of the country of which the testator was a national at the time of the making of the will or at the time of his death. Secondly, the law of the place where the testator made the will. Thirdly, the law of the place where, testator, where the testator was domiciled or habitually resident when the will was made or when he died. As far as immovables are concerned, it is the law of the Lex Sinus. And the law which governed succession, or would govern succession at the time the will was made. The will is thus valid if any of these apply. You see, therefore, what is meant by validity here. And validity, of course, has many other meanings, and one has to look at the context, and the meaning is derived from the context. Um, as as far as the regulation of the EU on matters of succession is concerned, the regulation is, and I'm now referring to page 8 uh, of the paper, the regulation is an effort to harmonize private international law in the European Union. As such, 
it is it influences the material law of each country but does not entirely change it in the result uh, to emphasize it deals with private international law and uh, uh, but as such it influences the material or substantive law but does not in every way change it. Um, the regulation entered in force in 2012 but is applicable only to succession of testators who die on or after August 17, 2015. The United Kingdom and uh, the Republic of Ireland have, have opted out of the regulation but may later join and opt in. And as I understand the situation with Denmark, it opted out permanently. It follows that 25 countries of the EU are presently covered by this regulation, some of which have historical ties with Canada, for example, uh, France. If present historical trends regarding the, the enlargement of the EU will continue, then additional countries will join. I now deal with the scope of the regulation and here refer to page 8 uh, of my paper. Uh, it applies to the, to the estates of deceased persons of all 25 countries. It does not apply to revenue, customs or so-called administrative matters which remain those of the countries concerned. Article 1 uh, of the regulation details many matters to which the regulation does not apply uh, and should be uh, examined and you will see that many of the matters which I covered beforehand regarding the law of Germany still stand but uh, basically the uh, substantial part um, uh, of changes is uh, derived from the uh, new conflict of law rules Now, as far as the jurisdiction of the courts is concerned, uh, according to the new regulation uh, in the EU, uh, and this is a general rule which applies not only to, to the jurisdiction, but also basically applies to the material law or the application of the law. The jurisdiction of the courts is as follows. The general rule is the court of the member state in which the deceased has his or her habitual residence at the time of death has jurisdiction. But there's a qualification there too because the Europeans are trying to unify their court system and there is such a thing as a European certificate of inheritance which may be applied for in any court in any country even about uh, other member states. There is the an effort of raising the accessibility to any jurisdiction of the EU uh, from the home jurisdiction. Um, to, to, to use an example of the application of the general rule that German courts would have jurisdiction if a Canadian citizen died domiciled in Germany. And there are certain exceptions. Um, uh, for instance, if the habitual residents are not located in a member state, and if a deceased is not a German citizen but a Canadian citizen, in that case German courts are competent if the, if the deceased had previous habitual residence in Germany, has assets there, and no more than five years have elapsed since. And there are other exceptions, which exceptions will have to be canvassed whether they apply by anyone properly attending to his duties and you see the matter therefore uh, involves quite a number of considerations. It is therefore important to know uh, uh, that uh, how proceedings in Germany operate uh, uh, and uh, when planning uh, an estate from Ontario. The European succession certificate uh, tends to uh, avoid or has as its aim to avoid a multiplicity of proceeding um, and therefore uh, the first uh, application is the application which generally counts. 
Now, the uh, as far as the as far as the applicable law in view, the e review, EU regulation, and I'm referring to page nine. As far as succession is concerned, the general rule is the law applicable to succession is the law of the state in which the deceased had his habitual residence. So, just therefore, just as I said, habitual residence is the main test in the EU uh, new regulation and is a way of simplifying the whole situation. But even there are some exceptions, uh, for instance, if at the time of death the deceased was obviously more connected to another state, that state's law will be applied to succession. So it is not the only test. Now, the term habitual residence, which is very key, is not defined in the regulation and does not mean the same as domicile. Um, although, although the meanings are rather close, the etymology of these words is revealing of their meaning. Domus, domicile, of course, comes from domus, Latin for home, and uh, domicile has a fair amount to do where someone is located, but more importantly, which jurisdiction one regards as one's home. And mere residence is not necessarily uh, determinative in that regard, although it is a significant factor. In the case of habitual uh, uh, res residence, the fact of being in a country is more important uh, than in the case of domicile, and therefore the meanings are not the same, and this adds to the complication of dealing uh, with uh, cross-border matters between uh, Ontario and uh, frankly not any uh, EU country uh, after the regulation is enforced. The habitual residence of the deceased has to be determined by an overall assessment of the circumstances of, lo of his life in every individual case, like duration and regularity of presence in a certain state and a stable connection to a certain state. For example, a German citizen dies with habitual residence in Ontario but owns real property in Germany. German court, the German court would apply Ontario law to the entire state according to the regulation. But Ontario's conflict of law rules determine German law to be applicable to real property uh, located in Germany and according to the regulation the referral is accepted uh, by Germany by way of envoi. As a consequence, the German court would apply Ontario law to the movables and German law to the immovables, like a court in Ontario would. Now, <clears throat> the regulation also deals with the validity of wills, and again, uh, there is a distinction as far as validity is, is concerned. It divides into formal validity uh, and uh, admissibility and substantive validity. And I basically refer here to what is contained in page 10 and thereabouts uh, of my paper. Uh, and as far as the formal validity of co is concerned, it is well to remember, and the regulation so provides, that the Hague Convention on the Conflict of Laws relating to the form of testamentary dispositions uh, of October 5, 1961, continues to govern wills, wills so the German rules as stated earlier, will still apply in regard to the formal validity of a will, uh, and there is no change insofar as it cover, is covered by the Hague Convention. But the new EU regulations essentially uh, repeats uh, that uh, uh, Hague Convention, but also expands the Hague Convention, and for that reason uh, uh, it should be carefully considered and not only the Hague Convention. As for the admissibility and substantive validity, uh, the, the scope of the term substan substantive validity as specified in the regulation uh, can be explained by what it is subsumed under the term. Uh, it applies to, to repeat, substantive validity applies to testamentary capacity, uh, it bars a person from making a will in favor of certain persons. It bars persons from receiving succession property from the testator. Uh, 
it deals with admission of representations for making a will, it deals with interpretation and disposition, it deals with fraud, duress, mistake, and other questions regarding the consent and, in, consent and intention of the testator. And it deals with the substantive validity of the will uh, in that it would have been applicable to the succession according to the, re to the regulation as if the testator had died on the day the will is made. See, now, now they're applying the law as if the, as, although the testator of course isn't dead yet, it is applied as if the testator had already died and that may be years later and that is something uh, to be carefully considered when so making wills. For example, a Canadian citizen with habitual residence in Germany makes a will and then moves back to Canada and dies in, uh, and dies in Germany. German law would be applied to admissibility and the substantive validity uh, of the will. Now, to avoid uncertainty, the law of the country, the testator is a citizen, uh, can be chosen as a law applicable to the validity of the will. On the one hand, that simplifies matters or increases its certainty, but choosing different countries where the testator is a citizen and then projecting that other law on some other country actually adds to problems. So, but here we are. Um, the next issue is choice of law and, and jurisdiction within the context of the regulation. It is introduced in the German context by the regulation and was not possible before. And I'm referring to about page 10 of my paper. Um, important uh, instrument uh, of estate planning to achieve uh, planning security and avoid uncertainty is there was accomplished but there is the drawback which I've referred to beforehand. Now as far as the applicable law of the uh, to be applied pursuant to the regulation uh, that is to say the new EU regulation <coughs> It is now possible to choose a law of a country where the testator is a citizen and apply it to the whole estate, regardless of where the immovables or movables are located and where the testator is habitually resident. You see that this makes it easier and more certain, but certainly, if you think it through, more complicated. It again throws material law on an other jurisdiction. An example is a German citizen with habitual residence in Canada can choose German law. A Canadian citizen with habitual residence in Germany can choose the law of his own province. A person with dual citizenship can choose between the laws of both countries. And the stipulation for validity of choice is that it has to be made or implied in the de declaration in the form of a disposition of the property upon death. Also, substantive validity of disposition must comply with the provi provisions of the law chosen. So, if you choose other law, you must apply its provisions and you can see the complications of any one lawyer knowing that much and ascertaining that he or she is doing the right thing. Um, choice of law was possible even before August 17, uh, 2015 if it complies with either the regulation or the national laws in place at the time of disposition. Further complication. For example, a Canadian citizen with habitual residence in Germany can already make a choice in favor of the law of his whole province. German courts will recognize it as valid if he dies after August 15, 2015. Uh, 
if a will was made prior to that date in accordance with the law that the deceased could have chosen, the later law will be deemed to have been chosen by the testator. And next, uh, the jurisdiction of a court. The testator can still not choose a form, but parties to a dispute arising after the testator's death can agree that the courts of the country whose law the testator has chosen will be competent instead of the courts in the state of his last habitual residence. Adding a further complication, although the aim is to simplify matters from an administrative point of view. Does it, you may ask? Now, so much for the uh, new e uh, e new regulation and uh, the simplification it brings about, but also the added uh, problems and complications. Uh, now, one way to avoid uh, the situation which we have uh, outlined here is, first of all, making multiple wills. And in Ontario, that is allowed, and uh, it appears to be on its way, or is already allowed in the other provinces. Um, that it, it's it's a good exercise because you make a law for your own province, and then recognize there was that you're really uh, dealing with a law of another jurisdiction when you make more than one will dealing with another jurisdiction and then you may ask yourself whether you are really competent to do that but it, that is that facing that reality I suggest is better than doing it the way it's done now in one will of your province dealing with property abroad and uh, facing all the complications that have been outlined uh, uh, multiple wills are certainly uh, used in Germany But when there are multiple wills, as you know, wills are revoked and you must make very sure that you're not revoking some other will or which you do not intend to revoke. You must make very clear in any one will about the other will and that also could be overlooked. And a second way to protect yourself is the use of international wills. Uh, there is a convention providing a uniform law on the form of an international will which was handed down in Washington DC in 1973 um, uh, and uh, all Canadian provinces have ratified except Quebec and the territories. Um, the convention however is enforced in relatively few countries thus restricting the applicability accordingly. Most recently Australia consented to be bound by the convention on September 10, 2014. However, some countries which have exceeded are important to Canada, um, such as the US, <coughs> the UK, France, Italy, Portugal, and the successor states of the former Yugoslavia. There's a, there are obviously uh, strong connections between any of these and Canada. Uh, regarding Germany, it has in fact not signed. And the, and the convention and what countries are exceeded to it are found in uh, presentation C under my name on the main webcast page. Now, I, I come to making some conclusions uh, and that is the regulation uh, uh, which I outlined makes cross-border estate planning both more flexible and more reliable and in some ways simpler, but I put it uh, to you in some ways makes it even more complicated. <coughs> to some extent uh, it provides uh, harmoniz harmonization between German and Canadian conflict of law rules because habitual residents and domicile are interpreted similarly although as I have stressed not identically and you must be careful in that regard. Ronvoy provisions of the reg regulation allow for the common law distinctions between movables and immovables to continue to influence German private international law. That distinction does remain, after all, in Ontario. Germany will now accept choice of law governing the estate as a whole, which is a real improvement 
for member states of the EU, but you may wonder whether Canadians would even tolerate uh, such an intrusion uh, upon its own sovereignty here. Um, and therefore, this may not be recognized by Canadian courts. On the other hand, in view of CETA, that is to say the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between Canada and the EU, uh, which is expected to come into full force in about two years, harmonization in this regard by way of later negotiation can be expected. And you see, again, the world is getting much smaller. Uh, we're now uh, allowed to uh, practice in uh, perhaps uh, all provinces or close to it, including Quebec. And uh, in some ways, um, there is now also harmonization, which uh, an important jurisdiction such as the European Union uh, already on its way, and more is to be expected. And it's good uh, to skate where the puck will be and not just where it is now. Uh, this future is well on its way in the coming. Um, Canadian citizen, citizens with habitual residence in Germany can avoid inconvenient provisions of German law such as the statutory portions or compulsory inheritances. Uh, you will recall that whereas the common law basically allows unrestricted freedom of testamentary disposition, um, the civilians do not. Thus, by choosing a law of their home province as applicable to their whole estate, Canadians can avoid the applicability of compulsory inheritance rules uh, of Germany. And I'm getting now uh, close to the end of my presentation, but uh, I leave you with this thought. thought. I'm sure you can absorb all I've said and uh, greater exactitude can be reached by reading my paper which aims to be of help in getting through the two main attachments uh, there too, namely the, the regulation consisting of some 42 pages and uh, the regulation regarding international uh, or the, the, the convention regarding international wills and I think uh, the um, regulation uh, it deserves careful reading. Uh, it it has a, a somewhat different style than we have here in Canada, but it does. If you have the patience to go through, uh, do it in in my view a very good or very in very good uh, style, and is quite comprehensible. Um, however, um, uh, you may ask yourself uh, whether all this will create more or less work for lawyers. Uh, uh, I think the answer is clear. Um, as the world gets smaller, there are more and more jurisdictions and cultures and histories uh, which uh, influence uh, legal decisions and uh, that adds very considerable complications. And we are dealing here with Europe, uh, which is relatively similar to uh, Canada um, you can imagine that uh, other areas of the world uh, are, will be even more difficult to handle than Europe, uh, which is at a similar stage of uh, economic and cultural and sociological development as Canada, or at least most of it. And you may ask yourself whether flat rates for wills uh, will have to increase. Uh, and. Uh, you may ask yourself whether it will take more or less skill to administer an estate and whether there is more or less of a need uh, for lawyers to be of assistance. I think the answer uh, speaks for itself and so we lawyers, again, uh, I put it to you, are here to stay for quite some time in the foreseeable future.